It gives me great joy to welcome you from, as Agatha says, a little bit cloudy, but nevertheless beautiful Lucerne to this book launch event. For once, the COVID pandemic has only partially been able to trouble our joy because without it, we would not have had the opportunity to gather so many participants from all over the globe. We will later see from how many places on this earth this Zoom invitation has been accepted, but I am confident that their number will reflect the truly global nature of this happening. Thank you very much for that. You have all received the agenda for this event. Let me briefly outline it for you. Uh, once we uh, will have finished with this welcome address, uh, Marta Pertegas and I will give you an overview of the development of the Hague Principles and of this book indeed. Then, uh, two of my uh, general co-editors, Jan Nels and Thomas Kaltner-Graziana, will give you an insight into the comparative, the general comparative report, which is the first chapter of this book. And then Andrew Dickinson, one of the two editors of the Oxford University Press uh, Private International Law Series, will uh, ad address us and thereafter some of the or most of the regional editors for this book will give us an insight into their part of the world and their uh, work with regard to this book, followed by representatives of the Hague Conference, which is the mother organization of the principles and two of its sister organizations, Ancitral and Unidra, and they will give us their perspectives on uh, the Hague principles or their approach to these principles. And uh, then Agatha Brandau, our associate editor, will tell us a little bit about future plans that we have. And finally, you will be able to uh, assist a Q&A question and answering session. And of course, you will be able to ask your own questions. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot uh, take questions and answer them directly during the presentation of the book because we just have too many participants, which is a nice thing. Now, uh, I will start together with Marta Pertigas by providing an overview of the process. But before I do that, we would like to play a special message we received from the Secretary General of the Hague Conference on Private International Law, Dr. Christoph Bernasconi. Dear editors, dear authors, friends, colleagues, all of you following this book launch online, welcome. I'm very pleased to send our warm greetings from The Hague. While it is, of course, a pity that we are unable to have this book launch in person, the silver lining is that we are able to welcome people from across the globe, which really underscores the importance of this event. It is a great pleasure to join the official presentation of the book, Choice of Law in International Commercial Contracts. It is without a doubt the most thorough and updated perspective on the Hague Principles, or as we like to call them at the Permanent Bureau now, the HCCH Principles. This publication with its 60 reports written by experts from all over the world is a truly impressive collective effort towards a shared goal, to enhance international trade and investment by recognizing the principle of party autonomy in international contracts. 
My first words of thanks go to the editors, Professors Daniel Gersberger, Thomas Carlo Graziano, and Jan Mills. They played key roles in the development of the principles as experts, members, first of the working group, and then of the special commission leading up to the adoption of the principles six years ago. Special thanks to Professor Gersberger, who was the chair of both the group and the special commission and whose expertise and able guidance led to the successful adoption of the principles. Heartfelt thanks to the three of you for not just envisaging this important book project, but following it through to full fruition, ensuring an impressive outcome. Special thanks and greetings also to the special editor, my former colleague, Professor Marta Bertigas, who had responsibility for the principal's project here at the PB. It is indeed very meaningful that her name and her efforts, past and present, are now also linked to this impressive publication. Thank you also to Oxford University Press for their support and for their willingness to continue to grow the remarkable Oxford Private International Law Series by adding this remarkable publication. My heartfelt thanks, of course, also go to the many authors, as well as all those involved in making this publication a reality. I was pleased to see so many familiar names among the contributors, foremost experts and true friends of the HCCH. And I remain indebted to all of you for your willingness to be such a crucial part of this publication. I'm confident, indeed, that because of your expertise, the book will prove to be an invaluable tool for scholars, practitioners, judges, arbitrators, and the broader legal community for raising awareness about the principles and about the importance of party autonomy in international trade. As we know, the usefulness of the principles has already been witnessed in areas of legislative reform and dispute resolution. In Paraguay, and very recently in Mozambique and Uruguay, efforts leading to the modernization of national law and international contracts have been inspired by the principles. The principles have, of course, also been an important source of inspiration for the adoption of the OAS Guide on the Law Applicable to International Contracts in the Americas in 2019. And in the area of arbitration, our new annual survey among commercial arbitration centers is showing that the principles or the core rules of the principles are being incorporated into their institutional rules used in solving disputes or advertised or promoted in other ways. The PB, as the guardian of the principles, of course, continues to actively promote them too. Building upon the endorsements that the principles have received from UNCITROL and the International Chamber of Commerce, we are in close contact with several international or regional organizations to the same effect. And I'm pleased to inform you that the Inter-American Juridical Committee of the OAS has unanimously endorsed the principles at its 98th regular session on the 9th of April, three weeks ago. But we will not stop here. I'm pleased to announce that our governing council has approved the idea of an international conference to review the use and operation of the principles together with several HCCH conventions in the field of commercial and finance law. This international conference will serve as a special special commission and will be held in the second half of 2022, contributing to the continuing promotion of the principles and relevant conventions. It is clear from the book and from the ongoing efforts by the PB that the HCCH principles are alive and well. There is no doubt that this impressive publication provides a rich and most important contribution to its field, and I hope you will all enjoy reading it as much as I will. I wish you a wonderful event, stay safe, and I hope to see you, if not before, in 2022 at the HCCH International Conference. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Christoph Bernasconi, uh, who is the Secretary General of uh, HCCH and whom I have known for many, many years. I'm very grateful to the Hague Conference to have made this instrument possible. And how this came about will now be summarized for us by Marta Pertegas, as Christoph Bernasconi himself said, a key, if not the key person in the development of the principles when she was the first secretary uh, of the permanent bureau there. Marta, we are very indebted to you for your tireless work on the H, H principles for many years. Uh, you are also a special editor of this book. You have assisted in engaging various authors, including those of the HCCH sister organizations, and you are also the author on the chapter regarding the history of the principles. It is with great pleasure that I give you the floor, Marta, to summarize this development for us. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Daniel, uh, for these uh, very kind words, uh, two uh, kind words. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what uh, uh, Daniel is asking me to do, I think, is to recap 100 years of history in 10 minutes uh, for you. Let me uh, explain to you. Actually, uh, you could uh, see uh, this, this uh, very important moment of the launch of this publication as uh, the moment to look back at the Hague Principles as the starting point of, uh, of this publication and, and all its developments as we uh, will be explained to you by uh, the different uh, speakers later uh, today. Uh, but I thought it was interesting perhaps to also say a few words on the institutional provenance of the Hague Principles and uh, how uh, long I, I believe the uh, efforts have been uh, of the Hague Conference in, in trying to promote uh, party autonomy. Um, so in my written chapter, as, as, as Daniel was saying, I uh, go back uh, a full century ago as uh, the first reference that I found to choice of law in contractual disputes can be traced back to the um, work, the preparatory work, the travaux préparatoires on, on contract of sales. And I was able to find that on the agenda of the sixth uh, session of the HCCH, which took place in uh, January 1928. So almost uh, indeed uh, one uh, century ago. Um, in the interest of time, because I have uh, only a few minutes, um, let me fast forward to, to the 70s of, of the past uh, century. Um, it was interesting to see, and, and, and actually, um, you know, l'histoire se répète, and there are uh, elements uh, that we uh, see coming time after time in the, in the history of the development of international instruments. Uh, so I was saying that uh, back then, we see that there are a number of uh, delegations, including the United States, that are requesting a broad mandate relating to contractual obligations uh, uh, to, to work on this uh, in the HCCH agenda. And uh, perhaps not surprisingly, if you think about uh, the, the, the decade, the 70s, uh, European uh, states uh, that are back then um, in, in the process of uh, creating and, and, and consolidating uh, the, uh, as it was then, uh, the European economic community, uh, that um, urge uh, for some uh, cautious approach and try to uh, put somehow on hold a very ambitious uh, worldwide project as they consider that it might uh, jeopardize the back then incipient efforts relating to the negotiation of what would become the, the Rome Convention. So you see, uh, it's all interrelated. Um, then uh, moving a bit further in the 80s, we see that the uh, topic is put again on the agenda, and this time uh, with uh, strong support from the pro professional circles. Um, the ICC, the International Cham Chamber of uh, Commerce, um, is uh, very much promoting the idea of uh, working in, in this uh, area, 
in the specific context of arbitral proceedings. So uh, there I also see a bit of a connection with uh, uh, one issue that was very much um, a, an aspiration of, of the uh, Hague principles since um, the inception of, of, of the work. And, and that was to try to be as influential as possible in international arbitration as well. Um, we will hear more about it, and, and there is a, a, a specific uh, chapter in, in the book uh, by, um, uh, you know, the, the real experts on arbitration who, who can tell us more about that. Um, as I said, uh, time goes on, and it is uh, Czechoslovakia, as it then was, which in, uh, in uh, the country uh, in 1980, um, submits again a proposal for a full-fledged uh, convention for all types of contracts. In the meantime, of course, the Hague Conference had been successful in concluding a number of um, conventions that dealt with specific aspects of specific contracts. Think about, for example, the agency uh, contract. But um, here uh, we see uh, yet another effort to try to have the, the, the topic as a whole on the agenda of the Hague Conference. Um, the Czechoslovak proposal was eventually rejected, but I think um, it, it provided us a very uh, good insights as to how we were to develop the, the, the project uh, of the Hague Principles later on. Most importantly, I would like to mention, I don't know if he's among the audience, but uh, the uh, former Secretary General of the Hague Conference, uh, back then, I believe he was a secretary of, of the Hague Conference, and uh, he produced the Van Loon re report. Uh, I'm referring to Hans Van Loon. And I, I believe, uh, well, his work was, was uh, quite um, significant as, and I quote, he uh, made the observation that the elaboration of a non-binding international instrument would be ad adequate for the subject of contractual obligations. Now, if we think uh, about this observation um, as, as, as we currently stand with the, with the Hague Principles alive, as uh, Dr. Bernasconi said, well, that, that um, may not be a big surprise. But if you think about uh, the observation in the early 80s, where the Hague Conference had only produced conventions, and he was uh, putting on the table the idea of diversification of the toolbox of um, instruments by the Hague Conference, I think that this was, uh, uh, well, quite a, quite a prescient ob observation that Hans uh, put on the table. I hope he is uh, among us today and he can comment if I'm uh, getting something wrong. Um, finally, Daniel, um, I, I can really be very, very short uh, when it comes to the elaboration process of the hate principles themselves from the moment that, I think it was in 2006, uh, there was a new mandate um, for, for the creation of a non-binding instrument until the completion of, uh, of the Hague Principles in 2015. Um, I can be very short because I think that it all boils down to uh, a very committed and wonderful group of experts who uh, respected and valued each other very much and under the masterful guidance of, of our host today, uh, were able to, um, in, in, in several meetings of the working group and later on a special commission were able to um, be able to agree despite the very uh, diverse views uh, that uh, there were there were around the table and then the only magic ingredient i think that uh, that uh, was there was some some bit of of legal creativity because as you will be able to read in 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 the written uh, contribution um, I believe that uh, these hate principles uh, can be characterized by a quite uh, sui generis uh, completion process. Um, no diplomatic conference, uh, a written procedure, um, special commission that was also somehow special. Um, so yes, the, all of that is, I guess, uh, history. Um, and what is important is that uh, the, the, the Hague uh, principles were able to be completed in, in to, uh, 2015. Um, with that, I wonder, Daniel, whether um, the completion of the Hague Principles, which I uh, stretched uh, over the, the past uh, century, uh, whether that was more or less difficult than the completion of, of the publication that brings us together today. So with that, I would like to give you back the floor for the continuation of this story. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Marta. You were very brief, which is, of course, very laudable. Uh, and uh, those of you, and I hope those uh, is the majority, or the majority of our participants are interested in reading her contribution in our book, which is, uh, of course, uh, much more going into detail in all the details uh, that you would wish for. Now, before I uh, start with giving you an overview of the development of this book, uh, I would like you to work, uh, or I already made you work. I uh, saw that uh, Agatha already uh, launched her survey with uh, three questions, namely the first question from where you are joining us today, the second question, uh, how you learned uh, about this event. And the third question, um, what was the third question again? Whether you are familiar uh, with the Hague principles, correct? Yes, exactly. So uh, the first question, uh, can our audience see the results of this poll or can only I see it? Yes, yes, it's, it's available. Uh. Okay, so um, I see that we have most of our participants from Europe, but uh, there are also large groups from Africa, uh, Asia, Latin America, and to some lesser extent, uh, North America and Australasia, which is possibly due also to the time zones. Uh, of course, uh, we all know that in Australia now it's past midnight, so we are very grateful to our Australasian uh, participants that they could made it and the same is of course uh, with regard to North America that had to some of you get up a little bit earlier than usual to listen and see us. Second question, how did you hear about this event? Uh, it's uh, not amazing nowadays that uh, it is LinkedIn which has the most the best influence uh, these times on such events, uh, fo followed by a specialized uh, blog, the Conflicts of Law Net, which is nice to see and hear because it shows that many of you experts and uh, becoming experts of uh, private international law uh, learned uh, about this book. And then uh, there were uh, organizations such as the HCCH itself, which were consulted uh, to find out what uh, the upcoming events were in this connection. And the third question uh, was whether you are familiar with the Hague principles or the HCCH principles as the HCCH itself wishes to call them. Uh, that's uh, interesting. Uh, we have 43% uh, that told us that they have a sound knowledge of the principles. That's a good, uh, very good message for us. Uh, there are about an equal uh, percentage of participants that answered that they are some what familiar with uh, the principles and only a, a very small minority did not hear about the principles or did not know uh, about the principles at all or almost at all. So that's uh, an interesting information. We have many experts on the principles gathered today, but we also have uh, many participants who would like to know more about the principles uh, 
And that's a very good message because it doesn't make us redundant in our presentation. And that would lead, some, lead me to my part of this first presentation, which would uh, be to tell you a little bit of the development of this book project. This book project was born on the weekend of 16th of September 2016, so uh, almost five years ago, when many former members of the working group that Marta uh, showed in her slides and further interested parties gathered here in Lucerne at the occasion of a scientific conference on the principles. The findings of the conference were later published in the Revue de Droit Uniform, the Uniform Law Review, also Oxford University Press uh, of 2017. So very, very uh, fast publication of the results of this, uh, of this conference. And this conference was used as an opportunity to ask those members of the former working groups, the experts, of course, on the principles, present at a breakfast meeting the day after. So that was the 17th, 17th uh, September of 2016, whether they would be amenable to further cooperate with the aim of publishing a comparative work on the principles and their possible use in the various regions and jurisdictions of the globe. And the answer was an overwhelming yes. Two working group members, Jan Nails uh, of the University of Johannesburg and Thomas Kautner-Graziano of the University of Geneva, had agreed earlier to form, uh, together with me, a three-partite general editors team. I believe that they were particularly qualified for acting as general editors because Jan has a profound knowledge not only of South African conflict of laws with its mixed system, but also of India and the private international law of many emerging states. He also has an institute at the university that deals with private international law of emerging states. Thomas, uh, having studied and qualified as a professor of private international law and comparative law in Berlin, uh, is of course an expert uh, in EU law, which to some extent was also uh, considered to a quite extended extent considered when we drafted these principles. And he also has a profound knowledge of German and Swiss law being of German origin, but having taught in Switzerland for a long time now. The positive attitude at the launch of the project in September 2016 has lasted throughout the almost five years of its planning and production. Even though we could physically meet only once in that entire period after 2016, namely in April 2019, again in Lucerne. The first major step in making this large research project possible was applying to the Swiss National Research Fund, a governmental entity in Switzerland. It had been clear from the outset that such a substantial project would not be feasible without the support of a dedicated team of researchers and administrative assistants. The funding by the SNF, as we call it, would allow us to compensate the team for its work, at least on a part-time basis and also have some infrastructure here at the University of Lucerne. For this purpose, a detailed application to the SNF was necessary, explaining and elaborating on the need for funding. Uh, that application itself took several months and was funded by my university, the University of Lucerne, for which I'm very grateful. In early 2018, the SNF granted the request, which made it possible to employ as our first project assistant, Linda Dosch, 
whom you see here in the middle of the picture. She's an original German lawyer who settled with her family here in central Switzerland. And she has worked as a researcher and assistant to this project for exactly three years now. So she's, well, she was the first a part of myself to, to uh, work uh, for this project. A few months later, our associate editor, Agata Brandau, joined as a senior researcher. Agata was selected from over 30 applicants most of whom had obtained a PhD already as opposed to Agatha, and they were all very qualified. The difficult decision, and it was a difficult decision then, was made easier when Agatha excelled in a final contest of the top applicants, and I think all here present agree that she was an excellent choice. She moved to Switzerland with her husband, especially for that. A purpose and began her work at the beginning of 2019, so two and a half years ago. The third researcher, Rorik uh, Tovar, originally from Peru, and now a PhD, summa cum laude, from the University of Bern, was recruited a year later to join forces with these ladies on the most in the most sensitive phase of the project. It fills me with great joy when I look at the world map indicating all countries for which individual reports have been written in our book. Uh, if you see uh, the map, it's really overwhelming to see that it's the greatest part territorially uh, of the world. And you see a slightly lighter blue color for the European Union, which is also a member of the H of the Hague Conference, has also uh, accepted the principles, although it has its own uh, instrument, the Rome One regulation. And you see also in a little bit lighter color uh, the member countries of OADA in Africa. So uh, all these countries and regions have been described in individual reports of this book, and we will tell you more about it just uh, in a minute. How does this all come about? Jan Nails, Thomas Kartner, and I foresaw in our research plan to motivate our fellow former working group members to act as editors for their own region supplemented by a co-regional uh, editor of their choice. The regional editors then proposed the names of experts, most of them personally known to them. These ladies and gentlemen would act as authors of a chapter on their respective jurisdictions. We also envisaged and succeeded in engaging authors for special reports on, uh, for example, specific uh, conflict of law developments in certain regions, such as in Asia, the PIL principles, in Africa, the African principles and OADA, the Organization of American States and the EU with its Rome regulation. We have special reports for these uh, developments in our book as well. And we also succeeded in engaging experts for important special reports. Simeon Simeonides, a very well-known expert in private international law from the United States, probably the best-known expert on the history of party autonomy, also uh, was very active in uh, the development of the principles. Marta Pertegas, whom you have seen already today on the history of the principles, and Lauro Gama de Sousa, Jose Moreno Rodriguez, and myself, uh, we wrote a special report on international arbitration in our book. Finally, we could also count on the HCCH itself and its sister NGOs to each contribute a report from their perspective. Once these many persons were contacted and had agreed to contribute, and there were 77 persons in total, including the 11 uh, regional and special editors, 
a contractual framework between these individuals, the editor's team and Oxford University Press, our chosen publisher had to be laid. In the meantime, we, the general editors, formulated a questionnaire to structure all country and regional reports in the same way. This questionnaire was circulated among the regional and special editors before a final version was submitted to all authors. Only then the authors had the green light to start writing their reports and almost of all of the authors submitted their draft manuscripts within the timeline set for these important steps and uh, all of you who have ever participated in a major publication a collective publication will agree with me that this is an exceptional situation and we are very grateful for that to all of our authors those draft reports were later discussed in the physical meeting uh, uh, mentioned already on april 11 2019 in Lucerne. You see some of us have a little bit grayer hair in the meantime, and I will tell you why. Um, uh, all of the regional editors were able to come except Jan Nails, but he was uh, already then uh, connected online, and you see his face uh, dominating the group uh, at the screen. And again, we had a very productive meeting and I believe it was wonderful weather as well in Lucerne, so we all we could even enjoy the lake after our work. Discuss <clears throat> all these drafts and uh, in the remaining period of almost two years until the final proofs were submitted to Oxford University Press early this year, all editors and the Lucerne team had to undertake quite some work. At the same time, we, the general editors, drafted the general report, which has now more than 100 pages, because we really wanted it to be a true report, referring to the individual reports and thereby comparing the different jurisdictions and regions. And I hope you will agree with us that we were successful when you uh, browse through this report or read it or even read it entirely. Finally, the Lucerne team, along with the authors, the general, regional and special editors had to bring the around 700,000 words of the manuscripts in line with OUP's, the publisher's guidelines. This was probably the most nerve wracking part of the entire process. And I am re really indebted and very grateful to our Lucerne team, but also to our uh, editors to have completed this work, which was burdensome in time. Nevertheless, and irrespective of the pandemic, uh, which had set another difficult obstacle to our smooth process, we succeeded with submitting the last proofs in time early this year to OUP. And uh, indeed, the publication was possible as planned in March 2021. So a good month ago, uh, and you will hear about how to acquire it even a little bit for a better price than advertised later in this event. So again, thank you very much for the many persons, more than 100 persons involved in this process and having contributed to making it successful. I will now uh, pass the floor to Thomas Kattner-Graziano, one uh, member of the uh, general editing team who will tell us about the general report and particularly focusing on Article 3 of the Principles. Thank you very much, Daniel. <clears throat> the book we are celebrating today, we just heard it contains more than 60 country and regional reports, and they all follow the structure of the Hague Principles on Choice of Law and International Commercial Contract. And they provide detailed information on the rules and principles governing choice of law in over the 60 jurisdictions worldwide. The book further contains general comparative reports on, on all relevant topics 
where we compare the information provided in the country reports with the hate principles and where we suggest conclusions. For the next 20 minutes, we would like to invite you to participate in this comparative experience. In November 2012, a special commission of 119 experts representing the member states of the Hague Conference was convened at The Hague. The commission was tasked with an in-depth review of what were then the draft Hague principles on choice of law and international diplomatic contact. During the meeting of the special commission, the most controversial provision was the rule that finally became Article 3 of the Hague Principle. Article 3 on rules of, of law provides that parties may submit their international contract to non-state rules of law, which are, quote, generally accepted on an international, supranational, or regional level as a neutral set and uh, Balance, uh, as a neutral and balanced set of rules. According to Article 3, a contract may as such be governed by a non-binding instrument formulated by an established international body, such as the unitary principles of international commercial contracts, the principles of European contract law, or the draft common frame of reference, for example. For proceedings before state courts, the reports in the book that we are celebrating today show that three different groups of jurisdictions can be identified regarding the approach suggested in Article 3 of the Hague Principle. First, for proceedings before state courts, a small minority of countries have so far accepted a liberal approach suggested in Article 3. Second, in a majority of jurisdictions worldwide for proceedings before state courts, parties are not allowed to designate non-state rules as the law governing their contract. In these countries and jurisdictions, the applicable law must necessarily be the state law. And third, the country reports in our book finally show that in a considerable number of jurisdictions, the question has not been decided. For well, the large majority of jurisdictions, including, for example, the European Union, following the rules suggested in Article 3 would thus be an innovation. An innovation that uh, remains controversial even after the adoption of the principles. This is exactly the reason why we, the editors, and our teams in Lucerne, Johannesburg, and Geneva suggest continuing this discussion with you today. Under the approach applied in the majority of jurisdictions, if parties designate non-state rules of law to govern their international contract, this choice is not ignored by the courts. It is just not recognized as a choice of law at the private international law level. The applicable law is then determined according to objective connecting factors. And the non-state rules of law chosen by the parties are integrated into the contract. Under this approach, the non-state rules of law are treated as contractual clauses rather than the law governing the contract. Let us briefly resume at this point. Article three of the Hague Principles suggests that parties may choose rules of law at the private international law level as the law governing the contract. In the majority of jurisdictions, however, the choice of rules of law has not or not yet been accepted at the private international law level. In these jurisdictions, a reference to rules of law leads to their incorporation into the contract together with other contractual clauses. Let's call this the majority approach. Does, the different, does this difference between the two approaches really matter? Should practitioners care? Was it worth discussing this issue during the whole meeting of the special commission at The Hague? And is it worth discussing it today? 
Our answer to these questions is a clear yes. The reason is that the solution prevailing in the majority of jurisdictions unnecessarily restricts party autonomy. It complicates the situation for international actors and it produces less appropriate results for parties to international contracts. In order to understand why the difference matters, it is necessary to connect the rules on choice of law with the rules on mandatory provisions and order public. Under the majority approach, the rules of non-state law chosen by the parties become part of the contract and replace the dispositive rules of the applicable state law. All mandatory provisions of that law remain applicable, and many national reports in our book confirm this explicitly. Under the Hague approach, on the other hand, the rules of law chosen by the parties become the applicable law and will as such govern the contract. However, this does not mean that mandatory rules do not play uh, any role at all under the Hague principles. Quite the contrary. Article 3 needs to be read in conjunction with the principles rules, uh, rules on mandatory provisions and order public in Article 11 of the principles. According to Article 11, the principles shall not prevent the court from applying overriding mandatory provisions of the law of the forum, which apply irrespective of the law chosen by the parties. There are thus two hurdles for these provisions, these mandatory provisions uh, to apply and uh, to take the two hurdles to take. First, they need to be mandatory in a domestic setting. And second, they need to require application, even if taking into consideration that the contract is international. According to Article 11.3 of the Hague Principles, the same applies if the designated rules of law lead to a result that would manifestly violate fundamental notions of public policy. Under the majority approach, which regards the chosen non-state rules of, uh, as contractual clauses only, and then designate a state law to apply, all mandatory rules of this state law apply, irrespective of the fact that the contract is international. The majority approach therefore disregards the international character of the situation, of the parties, and of their relationships. The international contract is, with respect to mandatory provisions, treated as if it were purely domestic. On the other hand, the Hague approach requires a further analysis into whether rules that are mandatory in domestic scenarios remain mandatory also when the contract is international. This may, on their specific aim, uh, this may depend on their specific aim the given factual situation and the proximity between the case and the forum. It is in this important respect and only in this respect that the majority approach and Article 3 of the Hague Principles materially diverge. This difference may be illustrated by an example. Seller and buyer form an international commercial contract. They exclude the CIST and agree that the contract shall be governed by the UNIDRA principle. The goods are delivered by the seller, but they are defective and cause damage to the buyer. Under the laws of state, I think we need to continue, yeah. Um, under the laws of state X, where the seller is domiciled, the buyer shall examine the goods without delay and notify the seller of any defect. Otherwise, the goods, uh, good is deemed accepted and any recourse against the seller is excluded, except for defects that the buyer could not have discovered. 
Such uh, provisions and obligations to examine exist, for example, in Swiss and German law. Let us assume that under the laws of X, this provision is mandatory. The UNIDRA principles, on the contrary, do not provide for such a duty of the buyer. They would instead apply a regular limitation period of three years to the buyer's damage claim. Let us assume that the buyer brings a damage claim against the seller and that under the private international law rules of the forum, the law chosen by the parties applies and in the absence of a choice, the law of the state of the seller's domicile applies, which is in our case, the law of X. Under the approach applied by the private international law rules in the majority of jurisdictions, the designation of the unit drug principles would not be regarded as a choice of law at the private international law level. Instead, in our case, the laws of X state X where the seller is domiciled would apply. The party's reference to the unit drug principles would be understood as incorporating them into the contract between the seller and the buyer. However, since the duty to examine the goods under the laws of X is non-dispositive, it is mandatory, it would continue to apply. If the buyer did not examine the goods without delay, he would be excluded from claiming against the seller. Under Article 3 of the Hague Principles, on the contrary, the parties' agreement that their contract shall be governed by the UNIDRA principles would be regarded as a choice of the applicable law. According to Article 11 of the Hague Principles, the duty to examine the goods under the laws of state X would apply only if this provision were mandatory, which is the case in the present scenario, and if the, this duty applied, I quote Article 11 Hague Principles, irrespective of the law chosen by the parties, that is, even if the contract is international. According to the official com uh, commentary to Article 11 of the Hague Principles, this may require a spe special importance to be assigned to that mandatory provision, taking into consideration its purpose and the strong link between the parties, the facts and the forum. It is very unlikely that the seller's duty to examine the goods would meet uh, these requirements. The example illustrates that under the approach applied in the majority of jurisdictions, the mandatory rules of state X apply irrespective of whether the situation is international. Under the approach of the Hague principles, on the other hand, Mandatory provisions of the Lex Fori apply only where their specific aim requires the application, taking into consideration that the situation is in fact international. It is in this respect, and only in this respect, that the two approaches materially diverge and that the, the difference between them really matters. Which of the two approaches deserves preference? The one that applies mandatory provisions irrespective of whether the contract is international, or conversely, the one that takes into consideration that the situation is international when it comes to determining the scope of application of mandatory rules. The answer to this question seems obvious. It is often stated that allowing the choice of non-state rules at the pri uh, private international law level would create legal uncertainty. This opinion also appears in a number of national reports in the book we are celebrating today. What exactly is this uncertainty? The first potential for uncertainty regards the rules of, rules of law that can be chosen by the parties. However, 
The Hague principles describe them as precisely as possible and provide examples in the official commentary. The national reports in our book show that it is crystal clear which rules may be taken into consideration. The Unidra principles, the PECL, the DCFR, similar principles in other parts of the world and international conventions beyond their actual scope of application. Regarding this first point, not much uncertainty remains. The second potential for uncertainty concerns mandatory provisions. Under the test currently applied in most jurisdictions, the question would be which provisions, notably of the Lex Fori, are mandatory for uh, commercial contracts under the applicable state law in general. Under the Hague principles, the test is which provisions, of, notably of the Lex Fori, are mandatory for commercial contracts, taking into consideration that the contract is international. It is not clear that the second test would create more uncertainty than the first. On the contrary, the latter approach, the Hague approach, takes into consideration that the situation is indeed international and it should therefore allow a more fine-tuned balancing of interests. Last but not least, Article 11 of the Hague Principles on Mandatory Provision is perfectly in line with the private international law rules on mandatory provisions in most jurisdictions. These national private international law provisions also require that if parties designate a foreign state law to govern their contract, the international con uh, character of the contract needs to be taken into account when examining whether mandatory provisions, for example, of the forum require to be applied. It is hard to see why this shall be different and the international character of the contract be ignored where the parties do not choose a foreign state law, but non-state principles of law instead. To conclude, the majority approach and the approach suggested in Article 3 of the Hague Principles diverge only with respect to the question of whether all mandatory states of an applicable state law, all mandatory rules of an applicable state law apply without taking into consideration that the contract is international, or alternatively, Mandatory rules of the Lex Fori apply only if they are mandatory, even when considering that the scenario is international, which is the Hague principles approach. It is only in respect, in this respect, that the divergence between the two approaches matters in practice. Commercial actors on the international scene are not necessarily, necessarily trained in law. To understand the approach suggested in Article 3 of the Hague Principles, they need to know that they are free to choose certain rules of law to govern their international contract, that these rules of law are modern, tailor-made, and well-adapted to the needs of cross-border contracting, that these rules are neutral, and avoid national particularities uh, that may come as a surprise to one or both parties to the contract. And they finally need to know that the application of these rules is subject to public policy and those mandatory rules of the uh, forum state which, reply, uh, uh, which require application even if the contract is international. All of these elements should be understandable for commercial actors even without prior legal studies. Under the majority approach, on the other hand, commercial actors need to know that they may designate certain rules of law to govern their international commercial contract, that these rules are modern, tailor-made, and particularly well-adapted for cross-border contracting, that they are neutral and avoid national particularities, 
but that this choice will, however, not be regarded as a choice of law. On top of this, they furthermore need to understand that the law governing their contract will then have to be determined using objective connecting factors of the forum's private international law system, that the rules of law that they have chosen will be integrated into their contract and replace non-mandatory rules of the applicable national contract law systems, and that the rules on public policy and all mandatory rules of the applicable state law will apply to their contract, irrespective of the fact that the situation is international and irrespective of whether the link to the state is strong. Understanding the latter approach, which is the majority approach, may require intensive legal counseling. All this shows that the approach suggested in the Hague Principles does indeed seem more suitable for international commercial contracts than the approach that is currently applied in most jurisdictions worldwide. In the jurisdictions that have so far rejected the Hague approach in Article 3, or that have not yet decided the issue, it might therefore be worth consider considering the liberal approach suggested in Article 3 of the Hague Principles, explained with examples in the official commentary to the Hague Principles and discussed in a worldwide perspective in the book we are celebrating today. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for attending. A huge thank you to all uh, contributors your contribution and the rich and reliable information that you provided have made it possible to prepare today's comparative presentation, establish all the other comparative reports in the book, and finally make available the book that we are celebrating today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thomas Kartner, Graziano, for these uh, very interesting thoughts. And I will not hesitate to immediately pass the floor to my third general editor, Jan Nils from Johannesburg. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say a few words on the value of our book um, that it may have for comparative private international law, uh, referring to our commentary on Article 4 from a personal research perspective, with other words, an example of academic storytelling. Article 4 itself doesn't list any factors to be taken into account in determining test choice of law. The official commentary only refers to these also listed in the Giuliano and Lagarde report on the Rome Convention. What was always bothering me though, was that in some common law systems at least, the factors to be taken into account in respect of the objective proper law seem to be very similar to these taken into account in the context of deducing a tacit or implied choice of law. But reading the national reports, I saw that this was of a general concern, very clearly addressed indeed, in the reports of two civil law systems, namely these of Japan and Lebanon. The authors object against their courts taking into account what they call objective elements, which they link to the now discredited hypothetical intention test. I found two striking examples of uh, such a use of factors, uh, namely in two other reports. First, the application of Pakistani law by a court in Bahrain on the basis of common nationality, place of contracting and place of partial performance. And second, the application of German law by an Italian court with reference to language, place of negotiations and conclusion of the contract and the chosen currency. However, various other European courts, in particular the Portuguese ones, found that even the cumulative effect of many objective factors was not sufficient to indicate a tacit choice of law. One option here would be to totally exclude the so-called objective factors in determining tacit choice. This is the option I found in the Tunisian report. 
Another possibility is the distinction between two types of indicators of tested choice of law, namely direct and indirect ones, which is most clearly made in the report for Liechtenstein. Now, most direct or strong indicators of intention are related to the contract itself. For instance, technical terms that belong to a specific legal system. While indirect or weak indicators are, for instance, place of performance and the currency. Now, the latter still have some relevance as they usually go back to the contract itself in the sense that the parties usually agree on the place of performance and the currency. But other objective factors as place of conclusion and place of residence are even more remote from the actual intention of the parties. But whatever further distinctions could be made, it became increasingly clear to me in the wise words of Professor Christopher Forsyth that no rule of law can provide a conclusive guide to the party's actual intention. However, the fact that most strong indicators seem to be directly traceable to the contract itself gave me more appreciation for the position in, for instance, Armenia, Norway, Oregon, and Quebec, and under the restatement second, where the tacit choice of law may only be deduced from the terms of the contract, although I would not prefer that model. And indeed, the inherently discretionary nature of deducing a test choice of law helped me understand the position in mainland China, Taiwan, Peru, and the Dubai International Financial Center, which according to the relevant reports do not recognize test choice of law at all. I would nevertheless go for the option of test choice, but to have via media in this regard, I would also go for a strict threshold, at least on the level as we find it in Article 4 of the Hague Principles, but preferably something more, as for instance in Ethiopia, with the notion of clearly evident, or in the proposed African principles, the choice must be manifestly clear. Nevertheless, one should not overemphasize the influence of a specific formulation on the day-to-day -day application of the law. For instance, South Korea adopted a rather lenient test for test choice of law in their legislation, referring to reasonable certainty as in the Rome Convention. Nevertheless, the South Korean courts, according to the national report, do not at all readily find that the parties tacitly chose a legal system to govern their contract. The living law may indeed not be found in the legislative text. Nevertheless, again, so it is submitted, one should formulate rules that are likely to be conducive of the results one has in mind. These are just some of the lessons I learned in drafting the commentary in our book on Article 4. It was intended to show how the book could be used as a starting point for a wide comparative study on many aspects of choice of law in international commercial contracts. Finally, I'd like to express my thanks and appreciation to my dear colleagues, Daniel Thomas, Marta, Associate Editor Agatha, who was absolutely critical to uh, this project. It's been a pleasure to work with you all, and also Linda and Rorik and all the others of the Lucerne team, the regional editors, and especially all the authors. I really enjoyed reading all the materials. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jan, also for showing us how uh, variable the uh, individual reports can be to make a general assessment on one of the issues that always or very often pop up with regard to choice of law, namely whether a tacit choice of law uh, suffices and uh, not only that, but also what uh, types of tacit choices there are out there. So uh, that should hopefully have increased your appetite 
if you have not uh, acquired the book already to do so. Now, uh, Agatha uh, has, together with our team, prepared another small survey, which we would like you to quickly work on, including three questions. Uh, you see them displayed. Do you think your colleagues would apply this instrument, namely the Hague principles? Uh, the second question, should the Hague Conference consider revisiting the Hague Principles, expanding on the law applicable in the absence of choice? And uh, number three, do you want to learn more about the Hague Principles uh, and how they could be useful in your jurisdiction? Uh, particularly important, I think, is the second question, um, because it will give us some more food for thought to uh, think about expanding the uh, current instrument or adding to the current instrument another instrument that deals with the equally important and equally or even more complicated question uh, how this issue is dealt with in the various regions and jurisdictions of this world, namely what happens if the parties themselves haven't chosen a applicable law to their contract and what the approach could be, whether they could be a unified approach and what uh, steps would have to be taken to overcome the diversity that still exists in this field. So please feel free to fill in this uh, questionnaire, this small questionnaire. If you haven't done so, uh, we will discuss it once we have listened to Andrew Dickinson, who is our next speaker. Andrew Dickinson himself, a former member of the working group and particularly involved in the drafting of Article 11, although he would not accept it anymore as his own because there were some developments that we couldn't foresee. Nevertheless, uh, Andrew is not only a, a former working group member, he's also a contributor to our book. He has written the very interesting uh, chapter on the United Kingdom, very interesting because it was, of course, uh, written in the middle of the uncertainties that really uh, lasted for quite some time uh, involved with Brexit. And he has been able to update his report several times uh, until he really was able to tell us how it works today. But Andrew Dickinson is not only a contributor, he's also a editor of the entire series that our book is part of, namely the Oxford University Press Private International Law Series. And uh, I'm very pleased to have him uh, address us as a representative of the uh, editors of this series. And the floor. Thank you, Daniel. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to participate in today's event that marks the uh, the culmination of a, of, a, of a fantastic project and the publication of a, of a, of a, a great work. Um, I've got the easy job. Um, I'm assuming everybody can hear me, but you never know. Um, but um, I've got the easy job. You're not going to get any learned academic commentary from, from me today. Instead, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about hats. Um, in English, and, and no doubt in many other languages, one, one speaks of a person as wearing more than one hat. Um, sometimes in legal circles, that's a cautionary expression, emphasizing the need to avoid conflicts of interest when one undertakes different roles. But more commonly, it refers to the existence of, of multiple reasons for a person to participate in and sometimes enjoy a particular occasion or event. And it's in this latter sense that I've worn several hats in the unfolding of this project. As Daniel said, I was a member of the expert working group which began to engage with the principals in 2010. And um, if, you, if you look very carefully at the photos that Agatha Omata circulated, showed earlier, you'll see my, my 
um, my attempts to avoid the camera either at the back or at the side of the picture, not quite managing it. Um, but it was a it was a wonderful experience um, with many many valued colleagues and friends to participate in the shaping of the principles. Um, and then I was one of the team that, as Daniel said again, that drafted the commentary on the principles. And I worked with Genevieve Sommier in particular to, to prepare the commentary on Article 11 and was then involved in as a speaker at the memorable conference held in Lucerne in, in 2016. Uh, at which work on this book project um, began. And it's taken five years to, to go from that early breakfast meeting, if I remember correctly, to get to the stage of publication. Again, Daniel's done all my work for me because he's made all the points I'm gonna make. As I, I, I'm one of the author of one of 68 contributions to this work. It's a remarkable achievement that the editors uh, and Agatha as assistant editor have brought together those 68 contributions. It must have seemed at times like herding cats, um, particularly as some of us kept claiming that we didn't have any material until the closing months of the project because nobody would tell us what our material was. And um, finally, and this is the hat I'm wearing today, um, I, I, I'm the joint editor of the, uh, with Jonathan Harris QC of the OUP Private International Series. And it's, it's a very enjoyable role in which we get, we get to work with authors and editors from the start of their project, taking them through, advising them if they need advice, um, trying to help out with problems if they arise, and then seeing the book finally come out in, in print. And here it is. And it's, it's really nice to have such a, a solid and valuable um, work in one's hand. Now, one could also see, keeping on the subject of the hats, that if one looks at the preamble to the principles, the principles also proudly wear several hats. Um, they are an affirmation of the principle of party autonomy in this area of private international law. They offer a valuable template for future instruments at national level or regional or international level. They uh, aspire to be used as an aid to interpreting, refining, and developing private international law instruments in this field. And they hope to be a practical tool for courts and administrators, as courts and tribunals rather, when they deal with choice of law issues. Now to this list formulated by the expert working group, and in particular, I think Jan was the one who, who identified these various hats that the principals would wear. We must now add a further elegant hat as an inspiration for future engagement between scholars and practitioners in the field of comparative private international law. Like Julian's codified edict, it may be that the most telling influence of the principles in the future will not be their black letter text, but the output that they produce in terms of collaborations, conferences, and published works that they generate. And this book is an outstanding start to that engagement. It's been a privilege to have one more opportunity to work with valued colleagues and friends in the production of this work. And my congratulations and those of Professor Jonathan Harris go to Daniel, to Thomas, to Jan, to Agatha, and to the whole of the team on this fantastic achievement. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew, for these kind words from under all your hats. So that uh, really uh, makes such a work uh, worth every minute. Let me know what video. If you get so, so nice words uh, from, from uh, your editor and your publisher, I don't see it anymore. Now let me quickly react to the um, survey. First question was, do you think your colleagues would apply this instrument? Uh, and 38% uh, said yes. The biggest group was the not sure um, group. Uh, and we hope that with uh, our book, that group will, will become smaller and the yes group will become even 
speaker. Second question, should the Hague Conference consider revisiting the Hague Principles? Uh, here we have an affirmative 79% yes, and uh, that's exactly what we hoped for, that uh, both groups, those uh, very much acquainted with the Hague Principles already, and those who know about private international law but haven't uh, accessed uh, the, the, the questions here, both clearly think that there should be further uh, uh, revisiting of the principles and maybe another instrument or even a convention on uh, the law applicable in the absence of choice. And I'm sure that this will be one of the main topics uh, that will be uh, discussed next year when the HCCH will make good with its promise to have a conference on these topics. Finally, the question, do you want to learn more about how the hate principles can be useful? 74% said yes, only 23% said uh, I am well informed and I want to spread the word and only 3% were not interested. It's probably my family who listens in, <laughs> but um, I'm very <laughs> pleased to have such a high number uh, of uh, affirmative votes here. So, uh, and of course, you will be even more informed if you have a closer look at our book. Now, the next session or phase of our launch event will be dedicated to our regional editors, to whom we are very much indebted because they really know the jurisdictions in their region, they know the experts there, and they have kept the contact with all these experts during the entire uh, period of the production of this, of this wonderful work. And not only had they uh, intense contact with their authors, but also with us. So they were the relay, so to say, an, an invaluable relay that we had uh, on at our hands without whom it would not have been possible to make such uh, a book possible. Let's start with our regional editors for the region of Africa, uh, namely Jan again, Jan Mails, whom you have seen already, and his co-editor Isa Fredericks, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Mercantile law and teaches international trade law at the University of Johannesburg as well. Isa. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you very much. And uh, as Andrew was saying a little earlier on, I'm, I'm getting some messages of an unstable internet connection. So I'm hoping that you all can hear, but one will never know. So <laughs> um, uh, uh, Daniel, I thank you very much. And thank you for the kind introduction. Um, this, uh, you've allotted me a whole five minutes, yet I shall only use one or so, but that's, uh, that's good enough. I, I, I believe uh, a lot has been said. And on behalf of Professor Niels and myself, as co-editors for the continent of Africa, we would love to thank all contributors to this section. Your reports have been amazing, and this has been confirmed by all three of the general editors when they read every word of your national and regional reports for the purposes of the general comparative report. And on this, we would like to particularly thank Professor Benke or Belly, or well, better known as Benke Albelti, who helped us with the editing of the North African reports. We as regional editors are hopeful that in general, that in future African private international law will take its rightful place in the international conflicts discourse. And we are confident that the current publication will substantially contribute in this regard. We are also encouraged by the interest shown in the envisaged African principles on the law applicable to international commercial contracts of which a possible first draft was recently published in the Uniform Law Review. Um, from my side, that is really all that, that one can say at this moment. I thank you, Daniel, Thomas, of course, Agatha, who, as Jan also said, was, was crucial, a vital role that was played in this entire project. 
but to the rest of you all, how, what other words could I express, you know, to, to, to indicate this great success in the first place. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Shukran. Bye, danke. Thank you very much, Isa, for these very kind words, uh, which mean a lot to us uh, from a region which has been neglected too long in private international law and has only recently really uh, shown that it has a lot to say to the development of private international law and you as representatives uh, of a uh, jurisdiction that has a little bit longer, uh, had a little bit longer uh, to develop its private international law are very, uh, you prove to be instrumental to uh, let us learn more about the other jurisdictions as well in Africa. Now, uh, you gave the buzzword for my next uh, introduction to a regional editor's team. Namely, you said uh, thank you to Benke or Belik El Balti and uh, regarding North Africa, Belik El Balti or Benke, as we uh, know him, uh, has is a Tunisian lawyer who migrated to Japan and has become a professor for private international law there. He is stationed uh, in Osaka. Uh, he's associate professor at the Graduate School of Law and Politics at the Osaka University. So he has also several hats on. He is a regional editor. He's the contributor for Tunisia and other uh, Eastern, Middle Eastern countries, but also uh, he's very knowledgeable, knowledgeable about Japanese law. Uh, together with Yuko Nishitani, uh, whom most of you will, of course, know because she's one of the leading private international law experts uh, in Asia, not only in Asia. I uh, have met her a long time ago as a doctoral student at the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg, where she wrote her thesis, her doctoral thesis on Mancini uh, and speaks perfectly German as well as many other languages apart from her mother tongue, Japanese. So we had an ideal team there too for Asia and uh, the Middle East. And I invite them to uh, uh, address a few words to us as well. So um, thank you very much, Daniel, for this kind introduction. Um, I'm truly um, delighted to take part in this event. So it was a wonderful team with the great and excellent colleagues and friends. So I truly enjoyed working with you in this team. Um, for an Asian, we had uh, one report on Asian principles on private international law and 21 national reports. So um, we really had a vast um, region to cover. And I'm truly grateful to uh, Professor um, Elbati Belik, <laughs> who um, um, provided an excellent contribution and helped uh, us a lot in editing the work. So, um, do you want to um, give us some overview um, of uh, agent jurisdictions or um, how should we pre proceed? Daniel? Sorry, I cannot hear you. You're it's absolutely maybe... free in how to address us. Uh, of course, it would be nice maybe also hear a little from, from, little bit from Benke, how uh, the development of the contributions in the Middle East uh, and, uh, of, of course, of you, the private international law principles in Asia uh, came about. Okay, so uh, I just want to uh, describe that um, um, East and South Asia includes uh, 11 national reports. Uh, and then um, 
while most of them are based on civil law jurisdictions, we also have common law jurisdictions, namely Hong Kong, Singapore, and India. So uh, the, there are a remarkable diversity among jurisdictions um, in the region I cover, namely East and South Asia. With regard to the use of Hague principles, um, for example, an Indonesian reporter indicated that they are uh, preparing their uh, domestic legislation on private international law and uh, Hague principles could inspire uh, uh, while doing that work. Um, because common law jurisdictions are based on case law, um, it was indicated by the Singaporean reporter that in 2016, Singapore High Court has actually referred to the Hague principles in uh, interpreting some uh, legal issues. In most jurisdictions I covered, uh, party autonomy is already uh, established without, ex uh, without uh, restrictions. And so unrelated law can also be chosen by the parties. An interesting exception is found in mainland China. The choice of law can be invalidated if the chosen law is not actually associated with the legal relationship at hand. As Thomas has already indicated, the choice of non-state law is not yet established. Although, for example, in Japan, we find um, prevailing academic opinions supporting the choice of uh, non-state law for litigation as well. It is also indicated by the um, mainland China reporter that um, they actually allow the choice of international treaties in maritime issues such as Hague um, rules or Hamburg rules that are not yet enforced in mainland China but uh, the parties are free to choose them in so far as um, social public interests are not violated or other mandatory rules of China. Hong Kong reporter interestingly alluded that uh, like in the case of arbitration, choice of non-state law should be able to uh, be accepted also for litigations. But um, um, it remains uh, um, further discussion and further developments to be observed in the future. As for tacit choice of law, we also found that, um, um, interestingly, that it is presupposed and um, accepted in most jurisdictions. Then uh, an ex um, exception is Taiwan, which clearly excludes tacit choice of law and accepts only express choice of law. Mainland China also requires that both parties invoke the applicable law in the court proceedings um, for the choice of law to be valid if it is not yet done in the contract itself. So that's um, a brief overview um, I can give you from my region. Um, as to the agent principles on private international law, it's an academic project we are now striving together with um, 10 colleagues from various agent jurisdictions. And we clearly rely on the Hague principles when we develop uh, choice of law in contracts. And uh, we also adapted Article 3 of the Hague principles and allow choice of non-state law. So uh, we hope that um, we can also further uh, develop our work based on the Hague principles. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yuko, for this insight. Uh, as you will, as you see, uh, Asia has a lot to offer uh, in the book as well, and uh, this will be now supplemented briefly by Benke or Belik uh, for the uh, North African Middle Eastern jurisdictions. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, so thank you very much, Daniel, and thank you. Uh, very much, Professor Nishitani. Uh, thank uh, also to all the members of the team. It was a real pleasure to, to be part of this team and to work with you. I would like to thank also all participants, wherever they are, uh, for joining us today to celebrate the publication uh, of this important book on choice of law international commercial contracts. Um, I, uh, please allow me first to uh, say a few words uh, uh, Thank, thankful words uh, first to Professor Nishitani and for Professor Neil for bringing me into this fascinating project. 
and uh, to all of you, all managing team, uh, for your confidence and your support. Uh, I would like also to thank all national reporters uh, with whom I had uh, the privilege to work for this book. I would like to thank them for their cooperation, passions, and interesting discussions uh, on various uh, issues uh, relating to the topic uh, we are uh, discussing today. So without delay, I would like briefly to provide you uh, with a general uh, overview uh, on West Asian perspective on the Hague Principle. We avoid, I avoided basically using the uh, term uh, Middle East because uh, there are some North African countries uh, which are uh, addressed in the part on Africa. So I prefer to use uh, West uh, Asia. And West Asia include here nine reports. Uh, which cover 12 West uh, Asian jurisdictions that can roughly be uh, divided into three groups. First group include ex-Soviet countries, which are treated together in one report on South Caucasian jurisdiction, basically Armenia, uh, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. A second group, which is most important in terms of number, include Arab and uh, Muslim jurisdictions. Uh, these include Bahrain, uh, Kuwait, Lebanon, Palestine, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Dubai, uh, Dubai uh, International Financial Center, and Iran. And uh, a third group includes Israel. Uh, almost all, this, all these jurisdictions have a statutory choice of law rule, including choice of law rule for contracts. Uh, there are two exceptions, however, uh, that deserve to be mentioned. Uh, these include uh, Israel and Lebanon, where choice of law rules in general are uh, not codified, and uh, this is uh, true also for choice of law for contract. So as far as the uh, principle of party autonomy, as enshrined in Article 2 of the Hague Principle is concerned, uh, a quick comparative glance shows that uh, the principle is largely recognized among West Asian uh, jurisdiction. There is one exception, I can say, uh, regarding uh, Iran, where party autonomy is admitted only in cases where all parties to the contracts are foreigners. Uh, of course, there are many differences, uh, there are some similarities, but let me give you some example about the differences. Uh, for example, as to whether um, a connection uh, between the chosen law uh, and the contract is required, we have a number of jurisdictions like Israel, uh, Dubai International Financial Center or Lebanon, where such uh, connection is not required. In other jurisdictions like uh, Qatar, uh, United Arab Emirates, or Bahrain, such connections seem to be uh, required. Um, there are also um, an interesting point concerning choice of non-state law, which was addressed by uh, Thomas. Uh, so unlike uh, principle three uh, of the Hague principle, which allow the party to choose non-state law, most jurisdictions do not allow such a choice. But there is, however, uh, an interesting exception, that is Bahrain, where legislation expressly allow parties to an international contract to choose law and customs of uh, international trade. Um, Although the principle of party autonomy is largely admitted in the region, in some countries, particularly uh, Arab Gulf countries, the principle can be seriously undermined by the procedural status of foreign law, be it the law chosen by the parties. In this jurisdiction, foreign law is treated as simple fact, uh, whose content has to be established by the party pleading its application. The rule of evidence in those countries complicate things, and their application sometimes uh, lead to deprive the principle of party autonomy from its practical values. So there are, uh, uh, these are only uh, aspects among many others that the reader will discover by reading the relevant chapters of the book, which I have to say uh, fills an important gap in literature since academic references, case law references in many of the, uh, the jurisdictions represented in the books uh, are simply uh, unavailable. So thank you very much for listening. This is all for me. And uh, I'll be, uh, I look forward to question in the QA session. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Benke. Uh, Yuko Nishitani, by the way, I forgot to mention that she is uh, herself a professor at uh, Kyoto University Graduate School of Law teaches, of course, private international law there. 
Now we turn to Australasia. Uh, I hope, uh, Brooke, you're still awake. <laughs> yes. Brooke, just. Uh, Brooke Marshall, she's our general editor for Australasia, including both Australia and New Zealand. And Brooke uh, is the one suffering most of the time lag from uh, here, Lucerne. Uh, I think it's pretty much at the exact opposite uh, uh, place of, of this globe. And because it's round, uh, it's a long way. So Brooke, please uh, address us from your uh, down under perspective. Thank you, Daniel. I'll begin by saying what, it, what an honor and a joy it has been to be part of this project. I'm so grateful to Professor Daniel Gersberger, to, to Agatha, to OUP, and to my colleague, Dr. Maria Hook, who contributed the chapter on New Zealand for bringing this book to fruition. In Australasia, the common law predominates choice of law rules for contract, perhaps unsurprisingly. The most burning question here is how those choice of law rules interact with silent or what might be called quiet statutes of the forum. How does the rule allowing parties to choose a foreign law to govern their contract sit with rules of the forum that are clearly mandatory in domestic cases, but rather shy about whether they apply in international ones? And I'd like to examine that question and how the Hague principles may help us to answer it by reference to a recent Australian case. Now, this was a case decided last month by the Federal Court of Australia in litigation between Epic Games and Apple. Epic Games develops a gaming app called Fortnite, which some of you may have played. It had breached its contract with Apple by creating a hot fix. A hot fix allows users to bypass Apple's in-app purchase mechanism for in-app content, and Apple earns a 30% commission from that mechanism. Apple responded to the breach by preventing users from downloading or updating the app. And what you see on this slide is the error message that you'll see if you try now to download the app from within Australia. So Epic brought proceedings in Australia, alleging that Apple had breached statutory mandatory provisions under Australian law on the misuse of market power and on unconscionable conduct. The relevant issue was whether those prohibitions would apply if the matter were to be heard in Australia, even though the parties had agreed in their contract on Californian law, and even though that contract was international. The court held that the Californian choice of law clause was of no effect, but only to the extent that it excluded these statutory prohibitions. Now, the point I want to make about this case is that the Hague principles could have provided some useful guidance and support for the two aspects of his honor's conclusion. So as to the first aspect, Justice Perrin began by stating that there is no case authority which holds that parties are prevented from contracting out of the statutory prohibition on the misuse of market power. His Honour went on to rely on a High Court authority in a domestic case in support of his proposition that they evidently are. In that respect, Justice Perrin drew no distinction expressly at least between directly contracting out of those prohibitions in a domestic case and indirectly contracting out in an international one. Now, in respect of the prohibition on unconscionable conduct, he cited a number of cross-border cases lending some support to that conclusion. And it is here that I suggest the Hague Principles would have been instructive. The commentary to Article 11, one of the Hague Principles provides guidance as to how to determine whether a provision has overriding mandatory effect. First, one should consider whether the provision is to be regarded as important for safeguarding the interests of the forum. And second, to have regard to the territorial or extraterritorial application of that provision. Importantly, the commentary underscores the exceptional nature of the qualification to party autonomy that overriding mandatory rules represent. Now, applying those principles to the relevant misuse of market power and unconscionable conduct provisions it seems probable that the court would have arrived at the same result. These provisions are designed to foster competition for the common good, and the legislation expressly provides for these prohibitions to have extraterritorial application. But the Hague Principles approach charts, I would suggest, a clear and cogent path to that result. The second aspect of Justice Perham's judgment is also consistent with the Hague Principles. The Hague Principles provide that the chosen law is to be disapplied only to the extent 
required by the overriding mandatory provision in question. And in that vein, Justice Perham observed that the choice of law agreement will, for no doubt for some purposes, remain effective. And one of those purposes was that Californian law would continue to apply to the interpretation of certain clauses within the party's contracts. Now, His Honour did not cite an authority for that proposition, namely the proposition that the chosen law is only displaced to the extent required by the mandatory rule in question. And I suggest that the Hague principles could in future cases usefully be drawn upon to support that proposition. I'm happy to talk about this or any of the other ways in which the Hague principles can facilitate the incremental development of the common law in a manner that is in line with, with international consensus in, in this area in the Q&A. And I'll endeavor to, to do so as coherently as possible uh, as I can at 1 a.m. in the morning Sydney time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brooke Marshall, for being with us and uh, elaborating on this interesting case, which I believe is not only uh, pending in, in Australian courts or has was not only pending in Australian courts, but I just read that it's also going to be uh, litigated here in Europe uh, between the same parties. So there will be some uh, race judicata uh, maybe issues as well. Now, um, Brooke is a lecturer at the Faculty of Law at the University of New South Wales in Sydney and traveling from Sydney now uh, to Europe, back to Thomas to address us very shortly uh, on the European perspective of our book. Excuse me, thank you, Daniel, for passing me the floor again. Europe counts 47 states and 27 of them are member states of the European Union, having the same private international law rules for contractual obligations, thanks to the Rome 1 regulation. This has, of course, made the task uh, for the general editor on Europe much easier uh, than uh, the task of um, many other uh, regional editors of the book. And what is more, uh, a considerable number of the, uh, of the other 20 European states have taken inspiration from the bon Rome 1 regulation in their own private international law system. In our book, this is the case in particular for Norway, where the courts have largely uh, followed the Rome 1 regulation, and Iceland, where the legislator incorporated the Rome 1 convention into domestic law, and I think it can also be said for Ukraine. Many thanks for Trugita Cordero Moss, Aidekur Berlaxon, and Dimitri Vorobe for the, their reports on these jurisdictions. Other private international law systems in Europe have opted for a more autonomous approach, such as notably Russia, the Western Balkans, and Turkey. Um, many thanks go to Milan, uh, Milana. Karayanidi, Donike Kerimi, and Nurai Exi for their reports on these jurisdictions. Switzerland has put into force its private international law in 1989, and there has been much influence between European uh, private international law and Swiss private international law in the field of international contracts, with some differences in detail. Many thanks go to Hannes Meile the co-author of the Swiss report. And last but not least, there is the UK with a somewhat hybrid situation. Andrew informs us in his report that for the period following the separation from the EU, the UK has taken the policy decision to continue to apply the Rome 1 regulation to contexts concluded even after the end of the UK membership. And the UK has adopted legislation to achieve that end. So Rome 1 continues to, apply, to be applied, but it remains to be seen to what extent the courts in the UK will continue to follow the case law of the European Court of Justice in this respect. In our book, the UK appears in the EU report for the period of its EU membership and for the situation from the 1st January onwards, 21 onwards, we have an additional separate report on the UK and uh, many, many thanks to Andrew Dickinson 
for having written this report in very challenging times. So many thanks to, again to all members of the Team Europe who have painted a very colorful picture of private international law in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this very brief uh, uh, flight over, over Europe. And uh, I, I want to thank you as regional editor as well, not only as general editor, but also as regional editor for Europe. Uh, this was quite the job, despite the Rome 1 regulation. And not only I want to thank you for this job, but also to have uh, assisted the Lucerne team with your own teams uh, in, in Geneva uh, at every moment of, of this process. Uh, and uh, we would not have been able to do it without you and Jan's team in Johannesburg uh, either. Now, next we travel from Europe to Latin America, uh, which was uh, edited uh, by Jose Moreno, who uh, cannot be with us because he's taking his vaccine, vaccine. And as we all know, this is the absolute priority for everyone uh, globally. And he was just given this, this uh, moment by uh, his health authorities uh, a few hours or days ago. So he will be uh, represented by Lauro, and maybe we can also uh, see him by a short video sequence. Lauro Gama being uh, the other uh, regional editor for Latin America. Lauro is a professor uh, of law uh, at the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro. He's also a very well-known expert in international arbitration. That's why he also participated in the special report on arbitration. The same is true for Jose Moreno Rodriguez, who is from Paraguay. He is both an academic and a practitioner, also especially in arbitration. He has his own institute, CEDEP, uh, of which we will hear here uh, in a moment uh, in Asuncion. And he's also a professor at the University of uh, the National University of Asuncion. You have the floor. I met Daniel Ginsberger in January 2010 when he started chairing the working group on the Hague Principle. Our meeting followed for more than four years, including the diplomatic session approving the document, also competently chaired by Daniel. In, his special commission, in this special commission conference, we interacted a lot. It was my honor when Daniel entrusted me to chair an ad hoc committee created to compromise on the acceptance of non-state law, an issue on which the European Union has strong disagreements with the other delegations. Please don't do it on my birthday, I said, joking. White smoke before dinner was indeed a present for my special day and for me, a way of thanking Daniel for the responsibility of having a discussion that it failed would have jeopardized the whole project on the hate principle. Fortunately, I continued seeing Daniel in Vienna in several of these moves, which he attended as head coach of the outstanding team of the University of Luzerne, which I even remember winning the first prize for the best memorial. On one of these occasions, he invited me to chat while drinking hot chocolate. You have never been to the demo, he asked. It is the best place in town. Daniel likewise invited the now McGill Professor Genevieve Sommier, also a member group that prepared the hate principle. The hot chocolate was indeed fantastic, more so when we heard what Daniel had to say. How about moving forward with a significant publication on the hate principle? covering jurisdictions of the five continents. We had in mind the whole project and the amenities for potentially acting as editors of the book. And of course, Genevieve and I wholeheartedly assented and pledged our full support. Together with esteemed colleague Laura Gama from Brazil, I acted as the regional reporter of the Latin American region. Once referred to as a comparative stream, 
the area justifies the assertion in this topic. Paraguay, my home country, pioneered as the first in the world to adopt the Hague Principles in national legislation. Initiatives in other countries in the region, like Brazil, Uruguay, Guatemala, and Colombia, also line up with the global instrument. Argentina appeals the court decision cited the document for interpretative purposes. And last but not least, the legendary Inter-American Judicial Committee of the Organization of American States adopted the guide on the applicable law to international contracts fully aligned with the Hague Principles. Less than a month ago, this committee approved a resolution formally endorsing this principle as the cherry of the cake. In its short existence, the Hague Principles thus produced a profound impact in Latin America. The chapters of this book dealing with countries in the region shed light on these changes, in some cases, anachronism, and others, and the challenges ahead. So thank you, Daniel and friends, for your time and effort found in the completion of this marvelous book. Thank you so much, uh, Jose. Although you're not present uh, uh, online, uh, this was a very nice gift you gave us by producing this video. And I will now uh, ask uh, Lauro to take the floor. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, following my friend, uh, Jose Antonio, I will now uh, uh, address briefly how the Hague principles can be relevant in the development of PIL rules in international contracts in Latin America. Uh, we found out that most Latin America PIL regimes on international contracts are outdated and unsophisticated. They are actually unable to cope with the complexity of contemporary, contemporary international transactions. Notable exceptions are the PIL rules of Venezuela, Peru, Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay. The Hague Principles can help in the development of PIL rules on international contracts in Latin America in two different ways. First, as stated in the uh, Hague Principles, in the preamble of the Hague Principles, the Hague Principles may be used as a model for international, national, uh, regional, supranational, and international instruments. This model function of the Hague Principles is mainly addressed to the legislator. Accordingly, the principles may stand as a regulation standard against which the national legislator can formulate more than choice of law rules concerning international contracts. This has been the case of Paraguay, who enacted in 2015 a new law on the law applicable to international contracts. And it is currently the case of a legislative bill pending before the Brazilian parliament. There is another relevant function of the Hague Principles, which is not contingent on the legislator's humor. The Hague Principles, as also stated in its preamble, may be used, it, used to interpret, supplement, and develop rules of private international law. This interpretative or supplementary function of the Hague Principles can help adjudicators, practitioners, and doctrinal authorities to fill in the gaps of the private international law regime applicable to the contract. As a result, new PIL rules on contracts may be created by case law or doctrinal construction. Either way, the principles can serve the purpose of developing new PIL rules on international contracts in Latin America, in particular, in respect of matters such as the broad definition of international contracts, the scope of uh, freedom of choice, Notably, uh, the Hague Principles can help in the creation of PIL rules, allowing for the choice of uh, rules of law applicable to international contracts, the regulation of express and tacit uh, choice of law, rules on, formal, on the formal validity of the choice of law, 
rules on the agreement on, on, on the choice of law and battle of forms, the severability, severability of the choice of law clause, uh, defining the scope of the chosen law, regulating the assignment in the case of contractual assignment, and uh, rules on the establishment of a party. In sum, the Hague principles can help a lot in modernizing our PIL regimes applicable to contracts. Thank you very much for your attention. Should you have any further questions, I'll be happy to answer them during our Q&A sessions. Thank you very much, Lauro, for these very supportive uh, words in support of, of the principles uh, in Latin America. We saw in these various reports we, we got from Latin America that there is indeed a need to unification, and I'm sure that the principles have assisted uh, you and others to, to uh, accelerate this, this uh, unification in this respect. Now, last but not least, I will address um, Geneviève Sommier, who is a professor at McGill University in Montreal. She is, uh, I think, trained as a common law lawyer, but uh, she's uh, a typical Canadian expert uh, who knows about both civil and common law, and she was uh, ideal to, to uh, represent the region uh, in North America, uh, including, of course, Quebec as a civil law uh, uh, regime. Uh, Geneviève was also a member of the uh, working group and, of course, the contributor of Canada as a author. So she has many hats on uh, and she's the most awake of us. That's why she, she goes last, but not least of our regional editors, Geneviève. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Daniel. Um, so it's, it's my pleasure to, to finish this uh, tour of the, the regional editors. Um, first, I, I would like to say when listening to some of the other regional editors, I really feel like uh, I don't have my place having only had two uh, countries in my region like uh, Brooke perhaps feels the same uh, way. I must say, however, that we did try Brooke and I to lend some assistance, particularly given that our book is written in English and many of the reports um, are produced. And that's one of their, the great value is that we have access in a, a language, uh, the, you know, the universal uh, legal language for so many countries of the world that otherwise are not accessible. So Brooke and I did try to lend our assistance in terms of English editing, because we, I think had, I shouldn't speak for her, but I know she, she did a lot of work on the English from other jurisdictions. Um, so I was very uh, um, uh, grateful to be able to work um, with uh, uh, Simeon Simonides and Neil Cohen who wrote the, the US uh, report and uh, I myself contributed the report on Canada. And just wanted to say a brief um, word about that. The, the, the point on the slide I indicated to say something about federalism and mainly because I think uh, Canada and the US are perhaps uh, uh, jurisdictions where uh, the federal nature of the state actually translates into different um, uh, contract law in the, um, in the units, the territorial units. And even though for uh, there's lots of harmonization because particularly in the US and the, uh, the Canadian common law provinces, it's common law, so there's not that much uh, statute. Nevertheless, choosing uh, the law of one of those uh, subunits is how you choose, uh, make a choice of law with respect to these two regions. So there's no such thing as choosing Canadian law in your contract or choosing American law. You have to choose the law of a specific um, uh, province for Canada or uh, state in, in the US. And so I, I think that might be one of the um, uh, things to learn in reading the, uh, the reports from uh, those two uh, regions because uh, both of them have endorsed largely party autonomy. And so in that sense, they're quite consistent with uh, the Hague principles in their um, uh, uh, approach to party autonomy. I did wanna take the opportunity of addressing you all, uh, maybe to say a word about um, non-state law, which uh, uh, Thomas very uh, uh, usefully and helpfully uh, exposed. 
to us. But I wanted to go back to uh, the early days in, in the working group, and I'm so grateful to see so many of you that were there. Um, and uh, you will recall, I'm sure, and I think Daniel in particular, right, very, very skeptical to the proposal that uh, we might uh, put forward um, an Article 3 on non-state law in the litigation uh, context. I think we had some very um, heated but always uh, cordial and respectful debates about uh, whether the Hague Principles should go um, take that step. I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, the working actually did support that. We know that it was uh, another battle at uh, the special commission and that the, the, the perhaps nice and simple uh, original article three was surrounded by many uh, uh, conditions and caveats that have given rise to some um, other debates. Um, but uh, I think in the end, uh, this article and this decision to put forward the possibility of non-state non law in uh, before state courts drew a lot of attention to the Hague principles. There are a lot of articles that have been written about that specific point. And so I think that it was, it was a leap of faith, perhaps a bit of a risk that the working group took in, to, in putting that forward. But I think it has been successful, if not in terms of changing the law on the ground, of at least uh, drawing attention to the issue, putting it into the minds of all of the rapporteurs who had to write and to all of the readers of this uh, wonderful uh, uh, book that I'm still waiting to receive. I don't know if there's you know, some border controls that have said this is a, a dangerous book to be led into the country, but I'm looking forward to having my own uh, uh, hard copy. And uh, I just wanted to finish by again, thanking uh, Daniel for his uh, great leadership of the, the working group and the, the special commission to Thomas and Jan for their uh, work, uh, putting this all together uh, to Agatha for her tireless uh, work uh, often behind the scenes and to all of my, um, uh, my colleagues and the contributors and to uh, Andrew in particular uh, for his work uh, on behalf of the publisher. So c'est tout pour moi, merci. Merci bien. Geneviève, I have fond memories of our meetings, uh, both in The Hague and in Johannesburg and uh, a lot of other places. Uh, it was always a, a great time and you were there uh, already in 2010. And I also remember the, the special commission fight that you just uh, alluded to uh, between, I think now it's almost prescribed that uh, the European Union was really uh, heavily attacking Article 3 and I'm sure that you um, that you uh, as the then I think uh, chair lady for that subcommittee that drafted Article 3 finally made a difference uh, in 2012 so that we have uh, Article 3 now uh, in the principles. And yes, I thank you also for helping us with our uh, non-native English to uh, improve uh, in, in this book. And you, you and, and Brooke did a great uh, deal of work with that without getting the credit for it in the book itself. So um, that concludes our round of presentations from the uh, regions, the regional editors. I'm so pleased to have heard you all. And we uh, go, we have a little, uh, we are a little behind, but I don't think we need the full Q&A session uh, time. So I think that's okay. Uh, we will now give the floor to the representatives of the um, NGOs. Uh, of the three organizations, the HCCH, represented by uh, Joao, uh, who is the, I'm just, uh, Bidawi, uh, who is the first secretary of the Permanent Bureau of the Hay Conference, HCCH, uh, representing uh, HCCH today. Uh, Anna Veneziano, 
who is the Deputy Secretary General of UNIDURA, the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law in Rome, and Luca Castellani, a legal officer in the Secretariat of UNCITRAL, the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, and head of its regional center for Asia and the Pacific. They all contributed to our book in uh, individual reports, but they have uh, kindly consented in addressing us with regard to a very recent uh, cooperative work of the three organizations. Please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Daniel. Just checking if you can hear me. Yes. Um, I will leave the reference to the legal guide to my colleagues from our sister organizations and I will briefly address how the HCCH sees the, the book and also updates you on its efforts to further promote the principles. Uh, we have heard from our Secretary General earlier and I can only echo how, how thankful we are at the Permanent Bureau to the editors and all the authors. And when I say we, of course, I'm referring to the Permanent Bureau of the Hague Conference, but in, particularly, uh, in particular also to the recently established team within the Permanent Bureau dealing with transnational litigation, integrating all the relevant instruments to transnational litigation. And that includes my colleagues, Ning Zhao, who also contributed to the, to the chapter, and also Elizabeth Zorilla and Nicole Sims. We decided um, to contribute to the book in a very pragmatic uh, way. We recognize, and I think we can all recognize, that international legal instruments, be it soft or hard law, are only meaningful if they are adopted and implemented as they are expected to. And therefore, our contribution focused on what we call the roadmap for the promotion of the principles with a particular focus on the role of international organizations, which basically requires additional engagement uh, with states uh, and with their intergovernmental organizations all to ensure enhanced levels of legitimacy for the principles, a stepping stone, we believe, for their broader use. And uh, the Hague Conference, surely the mother of the principles, as Daniel mentioned, but also as the guardian of the principles, has been implementing through the Permanent Bureau the published roadmap even before today's launching. And we have been doing so from The Hague, but also from Buenos Aires with our representative, the representative for Latin America and the Caribbean, Ignacio Goicochea, who is actively promoting legal reforms and assisting legal reforms in the region uh, with the principles, and also from Hong Kong, China, with our representative for Asia and the Pacific, Yun Zhao, also actively working within APEC to promote the principles. You have heard from the Secretary General and also from Jose Moreno that we just achieved one more endorsement of the principles in addition to those that were received right after the adoption by NCTRAL and by the International Chamber of Commerce. And I can confirm and share with you that we are currently discussing with five other intergovernmental organizations, global and regional, ways of concretely promote the principles, be it through an endorsement or in other relevant ways. Another good, is, a good example of our engagement in promoting the principles is, of course, Mozambique. I can confirm also that provisions aligned with the principles are part of a draft law on international commercial contracts being currently discussed between the government and the parliament of Mozambique. And we at the Permanent Bureau joined the World Bank and IFC on that specific effort. But our efforts don't stop there at encouraging international or regional endorsements or at modeling domestic legal frameworks. Actually, there are a number of additional avenues included in our roadmap that we are pursuing or that we intend to pursue in the coming years in promoting the principles, namely by, for example, demonstrating to international commercial courts the specific utility the principles may have for them or illustrating the role that the principles can also play in international commercial mediation further activated with the Singapore Convention, 
or by tailoring the promotion of the principles to certain international projects like the Belt and Road Initiative or the rising Build Back Better. Or for instance, by increasing awareness of the instrument within the context of negotiations of international trade agreements or raising awareness of the principles among in-house councils of trading companies or by promoting the principles at bar associations having in mind their bar exams and also their continuing professional development schemes. And finally, highlighting the key role the principles and party autonomy in choice of law can play in any future meaningful and feasible legal development related to transnational digital economy. And this will, by the way, be at the heart of our discussions during next year's international conference. And I took good note of the survey that we just had as an indication for future work. In conclusion, the Permanent Bureau at the HECH at the Hague Conference will of course continue pursuing in a holistic approach the promotion of the principles while simultaneously targeting specific stakeholders to achieve the goals that were set at the outset, the promotion of a well-framed party autonomy in international commercial contracts, benefiting transnational trade and investment as a whole. I thank you and we thank you very much. And I think now I can yield the floor to my dear colleague at our sister organization, uh, Unidroi Anna Veneziano, followed by my dearest former colleague and still a mentor, Luca Castellani from Ancitral. Anna, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Joao, and thank you very much for Professor Giesberger and Daniel. I am really delighted and honored to participate in this book launch on behalf of UNIDRA. And I, I know that uh, we are pressed for time, but allow me to express first uh, my personal and institutional thank you to all the general editors, as well as the regional special editors, the associate editor for this truly impressive publication. And uh, I would like to say that uh, among the editors, we count three past and present members of the UNIDRA Governing Council, Professors uh, Niels, Friedrichs, and uh, uh, Moreno, and uh, so many experts that uh, have devoted and devote their precious time to, uh, among other things, UNIDRA projects. So this family of uniform law is, is really truly linked together. And it is true that we are enjoying a very fruitful season of cooperation among the three sister organizations represented here. And one of the most recent outcomes is the publication of the tripartite legal guide, which fe features, among other, the HCC H principles, the CSG, uh, and the UNIDRA uh, principles. And I see here also some of the authors uh, of, of, of the guide together with my friends from our sister organizations. But Luca will say more about this. Uh, my question is, what is the UNIDRA's perspective of, on, on the HCCH principles? And uh, as highlighted in the contribution in the book, as well as in the tripartite legal guide, there is, of course, a strong synergy between the HCCH principles and the uh, UNIDRA principles and the model clauses from their application. Uh, and also, uh, the uh, UNIDRA was representing in the development of the principles. I recall participation of Professor Bonnell. So, uh, it has already been mentioned that the uh, principles, UNIDRA principles, are expressly cited as an example of those internationally accepted, neutral, and balanced rules of law that the HCCH principles allow parties to choose. And uh, it is true that the HCCH principles are respectful of any contrary provision contained in the applicable domestic law. And we know that this will apply particularly in the context of national courts and in many jurisdictions. But allow me to make only two points in this regard. First of all, this opening to party autonomy uh, in different contexts is still a very important message, 
not only to reaffirm that this choice is already possible in many contexts, so it's a kind of promotion for, for parties, for example, uh, and as uh, already mentioned, a message to legislators wishing to modernize their conflict of laws, but also, and this was mentioned too, uh, to judges interpreting existing national provisions uh, in a forward way, if possible. A second point, the model clauses for the application of the unitary principles expressly acknowledge the fact that the principles are a flexible tool and may be used uh, by contractual parties and adjudicators in a variety of ways. And this flexibility is what makes the principles, unitary principles so useful in practice. But in a way, the first and foremost way to use them is as veritable applicable law and as a minimum, a choice of law in favor of the principles, unidra principles would be interpreted as a reference to them by incorporation in the contract. And so in this, to sum up, the HCCH principles are at the same time, a good reminder for parties of the role that can be played already now by uniform contract law they are also a great opportunity for legislators and other decision makers to strengthen the role of party autonomy and the role of uniform law at the same time. And this is why we are really grateful to the HCCH uh, and all the drafters of the instrument for this important achievement and to the editors of this uh, truly impressive book for the invitation to participate in it and for their initiative. Thank you very much. I think what? I should have given the floor probably to Luca. <laughs> I, I thought that that was already that said by Joao, who acted as master of ceremonies. So Luca, <laughs> it's, I, it's your turn. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Also, good night to Brooke, of course. Uh, uh, thank, thanks uh, to, to everyone for the kind introductions. And uh, of course, uh, thanks to the organizers of these meetings and to the contributors uh, to, to, to this uh, uh, book. I have to say, first of foremost, a special thank on my part to the co-author of my contribution who is my uh, dear uh, former colleague and good friend, uh, Cyril Emery, who actually was the person who was working with the, with the, the HCCH on this matter. Our contribution uh, uh, from the answer to our perspective, it focuses and it's, it's interesting for those who are uh, keen on the travaux préparatoire as it, it uh, sheds some light on the answer to our perspective and the desire to take into account also uh, ancestral text, maybe a first draft uh, of the principles was uh, paying uh, attention uh, as it should be, of course, to the UNIDRA principles as, a, as a examples of applicable law. Um, our uh, uh, participation brought in also the CSG and other texts. Um, I would like to say uh, both uh, Joao, who was my successor actually in, in the office in the Regional Center for Asia and Pacific. And, and Anna already mentioned the, the tripartite guide and I thank Agatha for, for sharing the, the link in the chat. I believe that uh, uh, the contributions in this book and especially the tripartite guide, uh, they uh, bring back to the forefront the importance of keeping uh, uh, consistency among uniform control law texts, which uh, to a large extent, in my opinion, is already there. Um, of course, there will always be uh, some different opinions. There can be also some uh, possibly different outcomes, but in, in most cases, if not all cases, uh, uh, everything can be explained in the light of different uh, circumstances and also different policy options. Uh, but altogether, uh, there is a certain unity 
in the codification of this important field of uniform law. And I believe it is important to keep this in mind, especially when embarking on new projects. Um, this being said, I would like to add one uh, additional uh, view, more specifically from, from Ancitral, but this is, uh, this is by chance, because uh, when we talk about the CSG, we talk about a text uh, that was adopted by a diplomatic conference on which uh, Ancitral worked, uh, but worked only by chance in, in the last years. Before that, we know there was massive work done uh, both by UNIDRA and also in the Netherlands. So uh, it is really a uh, shared heritage. But uh, my question to, to, to an audience of specialists of private international law or, or my, my consideration rather that I want to share with you is, uh, it's really important to have soft law texts. Uh, they give us the opportunity to advance in our reflections and uh, to have also more sophisticated solutions. But especially in certain jurisdictions, often, but not only in developing countries. And we heard this uh, also with, with the various national reports. Uh, there could be different uh, uh, levels, varying levels of acceptance of principles like party autonomy or freedom of contract. And then we need to anchor these principles to hard law. And so I, I would like to say treaties like the CSG are those that even when opted out completely, give us the possibility to have the, this freedom of choice. So I, I would like to take advantage of, of, of this occasion to say, for those countries that have not yet adopted the CSG, they could consider this also in this perspective. Because at least for when it comes to, to uh, of course, contract for sale of goods. But we know the CSG has, has an effect also on other contracts. It, it is often seen as, as a, a authoritative statement of general principles. So, at, but at least for sales contracts, we know the adoption of the CSG brings in this opportunity. And for the other countries, when I say, well, let's remember that uh, the CSG is there uh, and let's remember that it gives us some interesting uh, insight and guidance on such matters. And it's an important cornerstone of, uh, of uh, uh, uniform commercial law. And as such, uh, uh, we should uh, pay due respect to it. And that's all uh, from my side. Uh, thank you very much. And I give back the floor to the real MC. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca, Anna, and Joao for your very supportive uh, words and also uh, words that reach further uh, out to promoting not only the principles, but also the instruments uh, that contain principles and their uh, interrelation. And there will certainly be have, to, uh, have to be work on that in the future. Now, our basically last uh, module, so to say, of this uh, event are the uh, announcement of future works and I'm happy to give the floor now to the spirit, not spiritus rector, but the administrative rector uh, of this conference, Agatha, also had many hats on, but she had, I think, the heaviest hat of all. Sometimes it was a little bit a hat out of lead, but uh, we kept her from burning out uh, when it just became too much. Uh, I think that was the contribution we could make uh, to help her guide us through this entire machinery that uh, was so successfully concluded in, in, in March and uh, will now be concluded with our book presentation. Marta, future project, uh, Marta, <laughs> Agatha. Yesterday I said Agatha to Marta and Marta to Agatha. So you're even. Yes. Agatha, <laughs> the future. Yes, thank you for your words. 
Um, I have three very brief remarks. Uh, first, as you can see in the slides, if you have enjoyed this event, probably you will be interested to learn more about the topic and attend SEDEP's course, which will be coming up in the fall semester. My second announcement, especially, and then I, I address uh, the authors here. If you haven't received your copy, please reach, reach out to us, to me or to Linda. Um, and for all of the attendees that are here, still with us, and thank you so much for your time and attendance, uh, I would like to offer on behalf of the editors a promotional code. Please take a screenshot of these letters, A-L-A-U-T-H-C-4. You can add this in the OUP uh, website when you are about to buy your copy, and I hope you, you have uh, the pleasure to, to read it. Uh, and in case you'd like to have a taste of what the book is before buying, please take a look at the sample chapter, uh, also available, as you can see, in the main part of the OUP website. And last but not least, um, I'd like to address already uh, a question that has popped up. Uh, Prosper Dumani has um, asked, what role can legal technology play in fostering the adoption of the principles? Well, that's a huge question, and I, I, do not, I cannot say that I have the answer for, for all that the that the legal technology can provide for the principles, but I can share um, what we are developing here. Um, and I guess from all that we have heard today, the question that remains is, where do we go from here? And I do believe that the future is digital. And um, I'd like to cover with you and give you a very brief sneak peek on the database that we are developing. As a Brazilian national, I'm a bit biased, and then um, I'm going to show you what if you could simply click on a country um, and discover more, see the data, and hear the experts whenever you need. Uh, for example, imagine if you could find all this relevant information about choice of law around the world in one place, one click away if you type on Google and find the right answer in English. So here we have the example for Brazil. We have the main questions that are uh, the structure that we follow for the comparative study. And then you would be able to find the answer. But not only that, you would find more um, materials and support uh, to understand the context behind those answers, precisely accessing the legislative uh, provisions and also the case law, the relevant files. Um, and I'd like to, to thank uh, the people that work with me in this project, namely Rorik and Linda. Um, and if you are interested to contribute or learn more about uh, the development of this project, and it's a continuation of what we are, but we started years ago. Uh, please send me an email. Um, yes, and I'd like to thank as well uh, the team here in Lucerne, Leah, I, I house it uh, for helping me organize this hybrid conference of sorts. Um, and without her, this wouldn't be possible. So thank you very much. Um, Professor Daniel would like to, to, to conclude with a few words before we move to the Q&A. Yes. Thank you very much, Agatha, for your relentless and tireless work. And you have deserved a break as of uh, tonight. Uh, we uh, are very happy to have had so uh, much attention from such a large audience for this book launch. That means a lot to me uh, personally, because it concludes to a certain extent a 11 year old project that I was able to participate in. It allowed me to make uh, a lot of friends in all parts of the world or to 
uh, resume friendships uh, of a long time ago in all parts of the world, but also to academically uh, work on a fascinating topic that was had a common basis, party autonomy worldwide, but a lot of questions that uh, arose uh, in, uh, in the course of our work, uh, not only questions, but also answers. And I hope we have given a lot of these answers in our book. Now we have a very short Q&A session. Normally they uh, are short in such big events, uh, but don't hesitate to uh, type your questions in now if you have them. If you have them later, feel free to address these questions to us in writing by sending us an email. Uh, that's, uh, of course, possible too in today's uh, networks. But we are happy to, to discuss some of them in, in the coming 10 minutes or so. Uh, we will make a short break so that you could uh, collect your thoughts and type down <laughs> your question. Um, I see that we already have some comments and questions um, and I will be moderating the debate. I will move to another room so it gives you one or two minutes to type more questions in. <laughs> Thank you, Agatha. So while Agatha is working, I have a first question. Uh, will this session be available for viewing later on YouTube or other such platforms? The answer is yes. The recording will be shared soon. Agatha, I am now handing over to you. Oh, I, I'm, I'm staying unmuted now. Good. So I see that we already have many questions. I'm going to recap a few. So first of all, uh, we have a question since the start of the event from Professor Marta to Professor Daniel, and she asks, whether uh, what was harder to uh, prepare the Hague principles itself or the book so we can take this question later uh, we could also continue the conversation on um, the need to revisit the Hague principles uh, on the area of absence of choice um, I would love to take any questions regarding the database as well and just to complete what I have said before, I think that allowing um, this research and data to be available online would uh, provide um, uh, practitioners 
and legislators and everybody who could be potentially affected by these rules, um, the possibility to compare good examples and have and draw inspirations and then develop further their own uh, private international law systems or to understand how the Hague principles could be applied in a specific case. Um, I see we received via the chat one question from, and I, I'm sorry if I do not pronounce your name correctly, um, Badredini Berralha, and the question was, uh, what are the position on the non-state law in the UK courts with the emergence of the Hague Principles? Is there an opportunity to consider the religious rules as non-state law under the Hague Principles? So I believe that I, this question could be addressed to Professor Thomas or Professor Andrew Dixon, that he's still with us here. Um, I see, let me take the Q&A. We have a comment uh, from uh, Christoph Ortel uh, addressing Professor Thomas as well. So perhaps Professor Thomas could say a few more words on this. Um, Hans van Loon uh, uh, made a, a very kind remark uh, congratulating us. And we are, of course, very um, grateful for all the previous work that you have done, uh, setting the ground and allowing us to, to, to really develop what we are doing right now. Uh, you are an inspiration. Uh, we have one offer. Um, Yeria Badar, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Uh, what will it take for national systems to accept non-state rules as the law governing the contracts? Perhaps Professor Thomas could expand on this as well, or even Professor Genevieve, um, because you are more or less also an expert on, on Article 3. Um, and last but not least, we have Lori uh, Morgan uh, from Freshfields. Uh, thank you for an excellent event. Uh, warm regards from New York City. Many cases in the US have failed to consider international instruments at all in choice of law discussions. Is this something that others have seen in other jurisdictions? What do, do you think is the most effective solution to this uneven application of international law? Good question. So now I will invite uh, Professor Thomas to, to expand on the comments and remarks that were made, and also to clarify the questions regarding Article 3. You are muted. Yes, thank you very much, Agatha. <clears throat> First of all, I would think we have, regarding the question, um, what is the role of non-state law before uh, courts in the UK? We have a much better specialist among us, which is Andrew Dickinson. So I would pass this question on to Andrew. For the other questions, um, well, we have father and mother, mother and father of Article 3 among us. So I would uh, absolutely uh, give the floor to Genevieve and Lauro first. And then uh, if anything remains, I will of course answer uh, whatever, uh, whatever there is to the answer. If I may. <laughs> so probably yes. Andrew, if you want, just want to develop a bit on, the question was non-state rules of law, which rules do they play before courts in the UK? in the future um I, i'm i would be happy to do so but i do notice on the chat that uh, hans would like to uh, make a, a a comment so i would like to defer to let hans answer first and then i will perhaps come back afterwards yes um so I, I'm going to, Professor uh, Hans, uh, be prepared because I'm going to open your microphone. Just one moment. Give me one sec and you will be able to talk. Uh, does it work for you, Professor Hans? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Can you see me? 
No, because I would have to, to do okay. more things. Well, and... it's an absolute delight to be uh, part of this, this, this exercise and to see, although virtually, so many of you friends and colleagues with whom I've been working uh, so, so, so long, and you've done a fantastic job. I mean, 68 participation is, is, is wonderful. I'm working at the moment with um, Rolf Michaels and uh, Veronica Ruiz on a conference and a book on the interaction between private international law and the sustainable development goals. We have 20 authors. Some of them have, uh, Genevieve is one of them, uh, Richard Opong is another. They have been fantastic uh, delivering their work uh, promptly. But others, it's a drama, it's a really a nightmare. So um, if that is true for 20 authors, I can only imagine how difficult it must be for 68. Now, I may have missed something because I had to interrupt my participation for about half an hour. But I wanted to, um, to, to highlight one aspect that uh, perhaps has not yet been mentioned, and it, it may be in the book, but I haven't seen the book. But I, I wanted to remind you that the origin of this idea for the Hague Conference to work on this topic came from a very important intervention, a joint intervention from our colleagues from UNIDRA and ANSICAL, um, the Secretary General of uh, UNIDRA and the Secretary of uh, ANSICAL at the time, because they had noticed in their global work that there were some countries in Latin America, in the Middle East, perhaps uh, elsewhere as well, where the notion of party autonomy was not known. And they said that it's a real handicap for this country, so please, Hague Conference, work on it. And I uh, remember that we were impressed by that intervention and accepted it, and that started the whole project. So it was a, another illustration of uh, the, the spirit of cooperation um, that um, is so important and is becoming uh, even more important now in, in our days. Um, the principles and the book the raise uh, awareness of party autonomy um, and help to broaden its use. I consider this as a first step, but there is a second step in my view. And I'm discovering that in the context of the work on that other book on the interaction between the sustainable development goals and private international law. That is um, that, uh, well, let me put it this way. Excluded from the principles are consumers and uh, employment contracts. Now, I wonder whether, of course, you can work on the, the, the non uh, the, the objective factors, but whether it is not worthwhile to look for a moment at the possibility of doing work on labor contracts in particular. Why I'm saying that? Well, there are one or two chapters in our, our book. Um, especially a contribution from um, Ula Lukunen from, from Finland, that make it very clear how full of gaps international employment law is at this moment. Yes, a lot of work has been done by the ILO, for instance, but that is at the state level uh, work, and, and very little is there to protect um, workers in the context of, of contractual arrangements. And I wonder whether that is not something that deserves our urgent attention. Think of the calamities in the work in Doha on the, uh, the, the football, I get 6,500 uh, casualties. Um, that is something that should not happen. And there should be contracts that protect workers uh, against such, such, such things. There are many other examples. It's, it's partly a matter of migration law, but it's also a matter perhaps of employment law. So I would recommend to uh, consider that as at least as, as, as one other possible option. And that brings me to a second uh, thought, that is that yes, there are helpful rules on mandatory law and, and public policy, but they are very broad and general. And I wonder whether it, there is not occasion to specify them more and to single out, for instance, or to make it clear that uh, the rugby principles uh, should have direct effect, uh, should be given con consideration in the context of mandatory uh, rules and, and public policy. And the same goes for environmental uh, protection or even good governance. Is there not um, reason 
to look with a sharper eye at these general uh, things that help to embed the contracts, but at this moment are extremely vague and unpredictable. I think there is maybe a need to work on that and ensure that um, we, we, we bring more clarity to the embeddement of, uh, of contracts. That was were some thoughts that came up. But first of all, many congratulations, fantastic job, and uh, please go on, uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hans. Um, I, we appreciate your insight and expertise. And now, so uh, in view of what Professor Hans has said, perhaps. The uh, professor, huh? <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I call in everyone. Professor Professor Yun could expand on uh, the other type of contracts if you would like to say a few more words, or Professor Daniel and um, even João, João, if you want to to address the institutional perspective from uh, the Hague Conference and what are um, the envisaged developments for the next year. Uh, Agatha, I go first because I first want to thank Hans van Loon to have participated at all. I mean, it's a great honor to have you here. Uh, I saw a picture today at the uh, screen where we stood uh, next to each other in 2010 when you were the general secretary. Um, and I I have fond memories of, of these uh, exchanges we had and for the excellent uh, of, of the Hague Conference then to, to the working group uh, without which we would not have done this. So thank you, Hans. Um, the, the second thought, I, uh, I think these are very broad questions and we will have difficulties within the short time that's left to address them. Uh, so I, I would uh, ask Jan and or Joa to be very short in their answers because they're open a very broad field, both public policy and, and labor contracts. And they're not re really within the reach of, of this group, uh, which, which has limited its, its research to, to choice of law. And extended it a little bit to the uh, to the law applicable in the absence of choice but they're fascinating subjects of course i can be very brief daniel with with your permission sure i want of course to thank hans for his very valuable contributions and these are very important topics that, but the most i can say of course on on behalf of the permanent bureau is that none of them are in the work program and, and they have not been raised by, by states. And so to the extent that that can happen and, and that, that doesn't hinder the Permanent Bureau to engage in some sort of research uh, to try to inform future discussions. But at, at this moment, none of those topics is being considered at the Hague Conference. Any, any uh, one knowing about such topics in other uh, organizations, such as UNIDO or UNCITRAL? Doesn't seem to be the case, so that would be food for thought and uh, for consideration of these important topics. I could imagine that labor law is not just private law and there will be have, have to be an interchange of, of various uh, areas of the law. Um, Agatha, back to you for uh, some further questions. Yes. Um, I see here, uh, so um, we, we could still uh, talk more about Article 3. Perhaps, uh, Professor Thomas, would you like to, to take the question um, what it will take for national systems to accept non-state rules as the law governing the contracts? Or we also have other comments from Christoph Ortel. So if you could um, merge these two in, in a minute, uh, give a feedback. Yes, thank you very much. Now that you invite me for a second time, I will give an answer, but then I pass the floor to Genevieve and to Lauro. 
yeah, what, what can be done to make choice of non-state rules of law more popular for legislators? I think the first thing that can be done, and that is what I tried, the message that I tried to, to bring over today, is there is a fear, I think, uh, to allow the choice of non-state rules of law because there is a fear that there are no safeguards. There are no safeguards left if you allow uh, non-state law uh, uh, rules of law to apply. And if you read Article 3 of the Hague Principles together with Article 11, you see there is a safeguard. So the uh, mandatory rules of a state law may also always apply um, uh, if, uh, if, if they require application, uh, even in, if the, the contract is international. So even if you choose the UNIFRA principles as the rules governing your contract, uh, Article 11 of the Hague principles or similar rules in all private and international law systems provide for a safeguard, but under the condition that uh, these uh, national monetary provisions require application even if the contract is, is uh, international. So um, first of all, I think make clear that it is not a step into the dark if you choose the UNIFRA principles and that there are no safeguards of any state law left. Yes, there are, because you need to read Article 3 and Article 11 together and uh, 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 corresponding provisions corresponding to Article 11 exist in every developed private international law system. So you have this safeguard. That's the first thing I would mention. And the second is, Make, make uh, practitioners more familiar with the UNIDRA principles. Make them more familiar. We all can teach them. Uh, when we teach national uh, 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 contract law, and all this refer briefly to the UNIDRA principles, and here you see similar rules there, or even more modern new rules there. Make practitioners familiar with the UNIDRA principles, because that is exactly uh, uh, another problem, the fear of the unknown. And the more you know about them, you know, the more you know their quality, uh, the more attractive they are. And then the question is, why should you do this? And here, uh, uh, I always refer to the situation. Uh, imagine you have a party in the Netherlands, in France, or any other home country of the people listening, contracting with a company in China. And then the question comes up, okay, uh, which law will govern our contract? And you may say, okay, uh, which law shall we choose? Dutch law, French law? Well, these are foreign languages for the Chinese. Chinese law, well, this is foreign language for the others. So it's always difficult to choose among these two state laws because if you choose one of the two, one party is necessarily advantaged. Okay, it's its own law, known, easy to, to uh, and you can, well, uh, you know the situation. So in this conflict, if you don't choose, and lawyers tell me, uh, when training lawyers, they tell me, oh, if we choose uh, the UNIFRA principles, this is a professional mistake because we, we haven't studied it. I say, okay, but if, if you don't choose anything, in my example, under the Rome 1 regulation, Chinese law will apply, the seller's law will apply. Is that easier for you? So why don't you, if you can't get the choice of your law through in these negotiations, you are better off to choose the UNIDRA principles. They are available on the internet in English with tons of case law, with tons of official commentary information. So you're better off choosing the UNIDRA principles than uh, leaping into the dark of having a foreign law uh, you don't even read the language of applied. So it's worth the effort. So if I resume, First, connect Article 3 with the rules on mandatory provisions. There are safeguards. If you choose, for example, the unit of principles, make, uh, make them popular and known to practitioners. And three, explain them why this is a benefit. Thank you, Professor Thomas. Um, Genevieve, Professor Genevieve and Professor Lauro, would you like to add something? And we, we have, um, we need to be concise. <laughs> yes, okay, I'm happy just to say a, a few words. Thank you, Thomas. I think you've explained the case for 
better understanding of it. But I also uh, want to, to, to stress that, uh, that to me, this isn't the most significant right, contribution of the Hague principles, because in a lot of jurisdictions, it's really the party autonomy, the basic rule that, that is, is the value. And I would say in particular, the lack of a necessary connection with the chosen law, because in a lot of jurisdictions that accept party autonomy, they require the connection. And that in a way, you know, responds also to your example, because those parties might say, okay, well, we'll choose English law. It's foreign to all of us. It's accessible, well-known, but you know, that also, I think, is a step forward, um, and 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 I must say that that to me, the one of the main reasons for allowing the choice of non-state law in litigation was because it is largely accepted in arbitration. Right, the arbitration statutes allow the parties to choose non-state law, and at least conceptually, right, I found that that was difficult to justify. Why can you choose something? in the arbitral setting, but not in the court setting. And so I think in addition to all the reasons you gave for why it's also a, a legitimate, to me, that was a strong point. And if you think now with the increasing uh, development of these uh, national courts sitting as international business courts, right? And allowing for choice of law, choice of procedure, and they are in a certain way competing with arbitration. I think that might be the first place where the choice of non-state law will be allowed. And once judges, right, experience this and see that the Unidua principles are perfectly uh, workable, I think that might be, uh, you know, opening the door a, a little bit. But I don't think that this is going to be the, you know, the uh, the future. Even in arbitration, where it's allowed, it's very still unusual for parties to choose uh, non-state law. Um, and so I think it's to to me it was opening the door, which is the most that the Hague principles uh, could do. And then it will be up to practice and also uh, by better understanding and knowledge of what it means to see where that where that goes. Agatha? Yes, Lauro, would you like to add something or is it good? I, I just wanted to, to actually address uh, quickly one uh, other, another question on, on Article 3 uh, that was uh, 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 made by, by, by uh, uh, someone in the audience. Is there an opportunity con to consider the religious uh, rules as non-state law under the Hague principles? And uh, I, in my opinion, Article 3 uh, also embraces uh, uh, non-religious, uh, I mean, religious uh, rules. Um, and they, this, the case of religious rules may come up, uh, especially in uh, regions where uh, religion, uh, where religious rules are uh, relevant for uh, contracts, especially um, um, Islamic finance, for example, and uh, in that case, I I I, I recall uh, the Bank Simco or Shamil Bank case um, uh, ruled uh, by the English courts in 2004, and I think that the the Hague principles may play a, a role in uh, making uh, more clear the um, uh, validity uh, of the effectiveness of, of, of religious rules, uh, the choice of religious rules in, in such cases. Uh, thank you very much. Good, thank you so much. Um, Professor Daniel, um, do you think we could take one more question or should we wrap it up? I mean, everyone can uh, leave. Who, who wants to leave, but I, I would nevertheless, I think, like to conclude. Let's take one last question and I will, uh, as the very last speaker, address uh, Marta's question. Okay, good, perfect, <laughs> yes. Um, I, I see here a new question in the Q&A from Sonal Kadan. Where do you see India in allowing parties the freedom to choose the law, govern the law, other than its domestic laws? And do you think Indian courts are proactively guard parties' freedom? So perhaps that's the chance for Professor Yan to speak up because he's the specialist here and he has written the Indian chapter on your book. 
Yes, Professor Yun. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Agatha. I think the Indian courts are very clear that party autonomy um, is recognized in Indian private international law, both in respect of express choice and tacit choice. Indeed, it is a very leading decision, I think, um, in respect of uh, the whole Commonwealth, uh, a leading decision on tacit choice of law uh, from the Indian Supreme Court in national thermal power. Um, the only aspect um, that could be uh, not clearly in conformity with the Hague principles would be Article 2.4, because in Indian case law, there are different opinions about whether a connection is required um, between uh, the contract in the parties and the chosen law. But I think it's clear that it is at least moving in the direction of allowing that. So definitely in Indian private international law at the moment, uh, party autonomy is fully recognized. Thank you. Perfect. So Professor Daniel, the floor is yours. And I, I would like to say thank you for all the attendees that are still here with us. Um, and we will be willing to take more questions or receive feedback um, afterwards via email and you can reach to me or to any of the panelists. Hmm? Professor Daniel. Thank you, Agatha, Agatha for, for uh, this final uh, word from you and I won't uh, let you be present more than uh, a few seconds, but I, I would like to conclude with, with uh, Marta's question to me that um, what, which was harder print, uh, to establish the principles or that book, I think, a very difficult question and a very personal question because there were two different tasks. The, the, the chair of the working group was different and similar in one, in one way. Uh, similar in that it, you need some managerial, I think, skills to, to lead a working group of academics as well, but it's more of a friendly exchange and uh, sometimes a diplomatic task rather than a scientific task. And I like diplomacy, so um, I, I liked it very much. And it was also a, a mediation sometimes, especially during the special commission meeting. So I like that part very much. Uh, the production of the books is, is more an organizational and uh, a research tasks. Uh, where you need a lot of assistance, but um, you also need some knowledge. And I, I like the combination uh, of, of organization and, and research as well. So, uh, but in the end, I think uh, the book was more difficult than the principles um, because it involves so many players who are not paid to, uh, to uh, obey. <laughs> and there is no, no, not so much of an organization as, as uh, an ACCH, which is really used to organizing these, these, uh, the development of, of their instruments. So I think the assistance was, was greater from organizational perspective than, than with regard to the book, which is really an academic venture. But it, both was a lot of fun, a lot of experience, and I really already deplore that both projects are now terminated. And with that, I would like to say goodbye to all of you, thanking you again for your patience, but you're also for your intention and uh, maybe also interest uh, for the book itself. Bye bye. In Australia, bye-bye in Europe, in Africa, Asia. <laughs>